was it unexpected? I knew she had had some issues, yeah. but I thought she was a little bit. She had some cancer and came uh -huh. back again. I would like to call to order the October 7th, 2019 Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners work session. Welcome everyone. Uh, I think we've got uh, two commissioners that will be joining us very shortly. They were running a little bit, little bit behind, so they, they will be here in um, a short amount of time. So at this time, the first item is approval of our work session agenda which you have before you, including the changes on page three. And then one additional change is we are eliminating item 4.7. I don't think that made it into the notes. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the work session agenda, including the changes to the agenda on page three and the deletion of item 4.7. And, and, and 6.1, we do not need closed session. Uh, yeah, and we will eliminate item 6.1, which is closed session. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes, and we move to discussion items. First up, we're happy to have Susie Morris to talk with us about the Census 2020. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to have with me today our two partnership specialists. Um, the census assigns local people to try and help jurisdictions with their needs and with outreach. We are very fortunate in that both of our representatives are from Cabarrus County. Um, so that, and you have, you can explain how many counties you have, but we just kind of lucked out with that. Um, so Mr. Peter Sabo is here with us uh, today. And Ms. LaWanda Blair Foster is also here with us, um, but she has to leave for another engagement um, in Taylorsville, so Mr. Sabo will be doing the presentation. Um, so what they're gonna do is kind of walk you through the process. 2020 is the year for the census, uh, and explain to you where we are at in the current process, uh, how that works, and then also answer any questions that you may have about the process or the census um, itself. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, commissioners, for allowing us to come and take a few moments of your time. <laughs> um, as you know, 2020 will be the decennial census. The United States has been doing the census since 1790 every 10 years. It's in the Constitution, and uh, it's going to be another great year or a great opportunity for us to make sure that everybody's counted uh, because it, it does have such a tremendous impact on the, uh, the community. <coughs> we love technology when it works. <laughs> well, the, uh, the goal for Census 2020 is to make sure that we count everybody once, only once, and in the right spot. We want to make sure we get the most accurate count possible, allowing citizens to participate and self-respond, trying to do that the, the most, that's going to be the most um, efficient way and the most accurate way first. Um, in 2010, uh, Cabarrus County had approximately 178,537 individuals. In 2018, that number grew approximately to 211,342, which is about a 15% growth. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we capture that growth that in, because it has a tremendous impact. 
it has two real important ones. One, obviously, is the political representation. It's the reapportionment of the 435 congressional seats. But to me, more importantly, it's the money and economic impact. Over $675 billion gets distributed across this country annually for things such as medical assistance programs, school lunch programs, supplemental nutritional assistance programs, um, things that impact the, the citizens of Cabarrus County on a daily basis. Uh, the roads that you drove on to get here today, those are all part of that $675 billion. And what we talk about is that the, the money goes where the response is, not necessarily where the need is. And that's why there's a big push for us to partner together to help get the information out to make sure that people participate and uh, get counted in the 2020 census. Um, as you can see, for 2020-10, the overall re the self-response rate in 20 uh, for North Carolina was 69 and 76 percent, respectively. The governor this year has a goal of 82 percent. Uh, Cabarrus County, you can see, remains steady at 78 percent for those two. But I think uh, with the one thing we learned in 2010 was to create these partnerships to help the uh, establish the complete count committees to help get the word out to help educate. In 2010, the Census Bureau conducted a survey where they looked at barriers, attitudes, and motivators for people to respond to the census. And the big barrier at that time was distrust of the government. Um, but the biggest motivator was once they learned how it impacts their daily lives, they were almost twice as uh, likely to participate in the census than beforehand. So it's, it's getting out using trusted voices of the community to help get the word out, to help educate them, and show the people of the community how this impacts their daily lives. And I think we can get up to that goal of 82% that the governor sent or uh, set for a self-response rate. Obviously what we want to do, we know there are people that will participate in the census and complete it, um, but there's a population out there that won't. And these are the targeted pop populations uh, that we are, uh, are just some of them that we identify as, as having that low response. Um, not always willing to, to participate because they think the information is going to be used in a certain way or anything. Children under five in 2010, there was more than a million kids not counted. And when you think about it, those are the kids that are now in uh, elementary school, middle school, and if we didn't count them back then, then the county can't properly uh, plan for additional schools or other classrooms or more teachers or provide any funding to those things. Uh, You've got almost 12,000 veterans living in the community. Uh, persons with disabilities under age 65, 6.7% of Cabarrus uh, County population. 19% uh, of the population are African Americans. And renters <coughs> make up almost a quarter of the households. Um, and again, it's getting out there and in educating people that every household needs to participate. And you're probably asking, well, how, how do we identify these communities? And what we use was we use the uh, Response Outreach Area Mapper. And it's open to anybody. The Census Bureau breaks down into census tracts. And when we look at Cabarrus County, you can see that the darker areas they have anywhere from a 27 to 28 percent non-response rate for uh, in 2010, and those are the areas, the the darker areas, um, the darker areas up here, is really where you want to then focus the area, um, focus your attention. But the Census Bureau, you have the little track, um, so this is the 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 track that has the most or the highest non-response rate. 
It had a 28.1% non-response rate, but we can identify the statistics of the population in those areas so that we can then focus the message. Um, it, it's Hispanics, uh, poverty, a large number of, with uh, families ch that have children under five, but we can go in and knowing the, uh, the, the demographics of those areas, we can then, with the help of the Complete Count Committee, start to focus on getting the message out to those, type, to those individuals and those households to help educate them and show them how replying to the census um, is going to help their community overall. As we talked about, it's, uh, the census collects information, but it's only for statistical purposes. As you can see, we use it for education, healthcare, transportation, emergency response, where are we gonna put the next uh, fire station? Um, where do we put the next hospital? It's used to determine so many things. For 2020, this is gonna be the first time that people will be able to respond to the census online. And what we'll be able to in about mid-March, people are gonna to start to receive a postcard. And that postcard will have a internet address for them to go to. They'll be able to go in. There'll be about 10 questions for them to answer. And once the information is received at the Census Bureau, their information is taken offline. Personal information is stripped away. And like I mentioned, the information can only be used for statistical purposes. Um, the other way, is gonna be via the telephone. Uh, there'll be a toll-free number that people can call if maybe they don't have access to the internet or um, they're just not comfortable with it. They'll be able to respond via the, the telephone. Uh, the phone and the internet right now are set up for people to respond in uh, up to 12 different languages. Uh, we're trying to expand that, uh, but right now it's, it's at 12. So like I mentioned, mid-March, you'll receive a postcard if you don't respond immediately, about 10 days later, you're gonna get a reminder. 10 days later, you're gonna receive about a third reminder, and at that time, you'd receive a paper questionnaire. The paper questionnaires are only gonna be available in English and Spanish. But like I mentioned, the internet and the phone will be available in, in multiple languages. Obviously, privacy and confidentiality are, are a big piece. Um, U.S. Code Title 13 uh, provides that information. It, uh, it makes sure that only the information that is gathered can only be used for statistical purposes. It cannot be shared with any other government agency. The information that um, is distributed to whether it's other government agencies or, or the public, they have access to the same information. Um, your personal information is safeguarded for 72 years. So right now, Census Bureau, uh, Census data from 1940 all the way back to 1790 is available through the National Archives, but data from 1950 to present day uh, is still secure. <coughs> the Governor Cooper created the uh, Complete Count Commission, they meet quarterly, uh, and their goal was for every county to establish a Complete Count Committee because they knew uh, how important it was to, um, to help get the word out and engage the population. They saw it work in 2010, and we know it'll work in 2020 to help get a better count. Like I said, the Complete Count Committees, um, We've been working uh, with Ms. Morris for uh, a while now to get the community involved, get the organizations uh, to come in and, and help identify those hard to count populations, those areas that uh, are less likely to respond to, and right now in the planning phase. So what we try to do is get together, identify how we're gonna reach people. It's easy to sit there and say, oh, well, we'll ask them to come to the library. Well, 
it's not just saying we get them to come to the library. How do we get them to, how do we get that message out to people? How do we make sure the, the libraries aren't overloaded or we, other, we ask other community organizations to help um, open their doors so that people can respond via the internet or, or help them get the message out? Like I said, what we're doing, uh, we're preparing now. This is when we start getting together and we start helping get the message out. Um, we talk about, sometimes it takes people up to 10 times seeing something before it really clicks on how important it is. So it's doing things through social media, through, um, through briefings, through presentations, through uh, handing stuff out at the Cabarrus County Fair a couple weeks ago, um, and, and whether it's something through their employer, something through the uh, organization that they attend, um, it's getting that message out and, and getting them to understand how important it is. Uh, like I said, between now and January is really a lot of the planning, and come January through March is when it really starts hitting the, the population. We have uh, Census Bureau, obviously, uh, Lawanda and myself live here in Cabarrus County. Uh, we also support, myself, I support um, Union, Stanley, and Rowan counties, as well as Cabarrus. Um, but we have about 30 partnership specialists throughout the state of North Carolina, and we're constantly helping each other, depending on what's going on, when people uh, need help with a presentation or coming up with uh, ideas to help get the message out um, and providing uh, handouts all the handouts that you have are electronic so people can go on to the Census Bureau website and download the uh, the handouts um, but it's making sure that we can be that subject matter expert to help educate people and get the word out obviously the Census Bureau is looking to hire thousands of people in the next uh, coming months. Um, we want people to be from the local communities because, again, they're trusted voices. They know the areas. They know, you know, where some of those harder addresses to find are. So when it comes to those hiring those enumerators, we're looking to hire a lot of people. Um, and uh, and one thing. Uh, we always tell people is, is veterans tend to get a, a little preference in getting the hiring. So, um, with the with the folders that I left you, uh, I gave you some basic information on uh, Census 101, talking about what the census is, how it uh, you know how it came about in the Constitution, how it's used. Um, there's a flyer for 50 ways that the census information is used. The confidentiality, information about recruiting and hiring, um, and, and just some general good information. And uh, pending any questions that you may have, that completes my presentation. I have one question, Peter. You, you showed us the um, response rate for North Carolina being somewhere around 76 percent in 2010, and your uh, Governor Cooper's goal was 82 percent this year. How is that comparable to other states? I'd have to get back with you. I'll be honest and, and tell you I'm not really sure how it compares to the other states. Um, I know we were, we were, I was focused on North Carolina, sure. the, the other counties. Um, and as you can see from the other counties, getting the message out, getting people engaged, it, it really educates them on how to um, on the importance of responding. Um, well, the, well, the census obviously is a nationwide census. Correct. It's nationwide. And if we're running at 76% and other states such as California or New York or whatever, and they run at 80 or 90%, obviously they're getting more funds than we are. Well, keep or is in it mind based this, on is, per capita? Th this is the, the initial self response rate. So from there, we do the uh, the enumerators will go out and they'll do door to door counting all the addresses or going to the addresses that people didn't respond. Um, 
But obviously, if people self-respond, the greater self-response, the more accurate the count is. When we have to go door to door, it becomes less likely that we're going to get accurate numbers because people may not be home and we're asking the neighbor, hey, how many people do you think live in that house versus somebody actually responding to the question of how many people actually live in that house. So um, this would be the first step now when you get the, you know, since the process has changed and they're no, they're no longer sending out the paper copies that you used to receive in the mail, at, you know, that's what you that's what you received and then that's what you filled out this time it will be that postcard encouraging you either to go on to the internet or to call um, or there is I believe an option where you can also ask for that paper copy if that's your preference so I think this slide reflects just that that initial first contact where yes. people received it filled it out and there what there was not that follow-up that sometimes happens I and mean, then just to let you all know where we're at in the process. Um, so we have had uh, two meetings, two complete count committee meetings. Um, our next meeting will be in October and at that meeting will be, um, so at the last meeting we talked about challenges uh, for uh, completing the census, why people are discouraged to complete the census, what would keep them from completing the census, especially since this year a big challenge is going to be reaching out to the populations that may not have access to the internet um, that's huge second piece of that is if you get the postcard in the mail you know we always teach people don't give people your personal information that enumerator is going to show up at your door with an iPad or a cell phone and want your personal information um, so, you know, it's very going to be very different this year. So we're really going to have to get the word out. You know, best thing is, is when you get the postcard in the mail, take, take that five minutes, complete the 10 questions, and then nobody's going to be knocking at your door and you're not going to have that person and you control the information, you know, how it, how it is received by the census. Um, so we'll be having our second, I mean, I'm sorry, our third meeting on October 22nd, and that will be the meeting where we'll start, start crafting the messages to the different groups um, that we know, um, you know, ex for example, with the veterans, what is the message that we need to get out to the veterans and where are some available <clears throat> resources? Because we know that a lot of people don't have access to the internet. Um, you know, how can we reach out to the home, homeless population here, specifically in Cabarrus County? The census has uh, teams that they send out for special populations, but is there anything that we can do to help facilitate that here in Cabarrus County? So that's where we're at right now in the process. So to people at home that may be watching and might be interested in applying to help, when does that start? Is it full-time, part-time, a variety of opportunities, and how long does it last? We encourage everybody to go online. Uh, it's 2020census.gov slash jobs is the website. To go online now, because obviously there is a background investigation that goes on because people will be handling sensitive information. Um, but the, uh, the jobs can, uh, it's a minimum of 20 hours per week up to 40 hours per week and uh, being in the uh, Charlotte regional area um, it's 16 to 18 dollars an hour um, and depending on what the jobs are um, as you get as you get processed through the the system uh, they will interview you for different jobs it may be as an enumerator it may be working into um, in the office helping uh, manage the data and, and everything um, but we encourage everybody to go online now because it it is a little time consuming to get through the process uh, and obviously April 1st 2020 will be here before we know it and the April 1st date is what the federal government is referring to as census day so they're encouraging everybody to have some type of celebration that day um, you know to encourage people to go in and go ahead and complete the census. Um, so we will probably have some type of activity that day. I have one last question. What's the turnaround time on the data? 
for, so the last day somebody can participate in the census <coughs> is July 31st. Right. The information has to be uh, gathered <coughs> and put in statistical form and presented to the president no later than the 31st of December, 2020. Uh, 2021, in January of 2021, the president will give the information to Congress, and I believe it's in April that it will then come to the states for the uh, redistricting. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize <coughs> is even though, you know, the big sense, the sense of the uh, every 10 years we have a census where everybody gets counted. Um, each year for the uh, community survey, there are also um, surveys that get sent out. So you may receive, not in a census year, you may receive a different survey where they're constantly taking um, segments of the population and then updating that information. Um, so right now you could go on to the census website and you could look at the American Community Survey and you could actually find updated data for Cabarrus County, and then taking that together with the state demographer's office can get a pretty good idea of what's happening here. Any other questions? Thank you very much. We appreciate you being with Thank us. Thank you very today. much Thank for you. your time. You. Okay, next up, we have from Active Living and Parks, their annual report. We're happy to have Londa Strong and Brian Hagler. I promise I'm not going to read all this to you. I brought it just for to show you how far we've come with our communications department. This was the first annual report that I did in 1983. We've, we've come a long way now from this to what you have now, which is this with all the nice information inside there. Um, I ran across these one day last week and I was like, oh, that'd be interesting. And we've had all kinds of different formats all in between from small and large until we got our communications department. And thank you, Kasha, for turning this into a wonderful document that we now have. Um, there were a couple of things that I did see when I went through there that I wanted to highlight a little bit before Byron goes over um, this past year. And it came out of that the 1983 and 84 one was the first one which we had the maintenance division was in our department and we took care of all of the grounds with five five people. <laughs> I don't remember exactly what the budget was, but the total budget for the year was $410,000. There were 90,000 people in uh, Cabarrus County at that time. We did have two matching incentive grant projects that year for a total of $10,250. I mean, we were doing a lot with that money. And the cost per capita was $4.54. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting when we looked through it. Um, ten years ago, the Franklin's Park participation was 233,000 people, uh, VVP or North Cabarrus Park at the time, and Spencer was 119,000. We had $80,000 in incentive grants and was 481,000 in programs. Uh, in 10 years, I think you'll be interested to hear what Byron's getting ready to tell you, the numbers and the programs and the things are. And if you ever have any interest in wanting to look at any of these, please feel free to let me know. Uh, I have most everyone from 1983. There are a few that are missing. Not sure why, but a few. Just there's some interesting uh, documentation in there. Some of the numbers that she mentioned. Just I'd like to start off with the overall participations with the department. Over 1,032,000 participations between the parks and the senior centers and the programs and events and just utilizing the facilities. Just an extremely impressive number of those that want to utilize and are taking advantage of, of the facilities that we, we have available for them in the county. The numbers that she just mentioned for, since she mentioned Frank List Park, 200,000, I believe, participations 10 years ago. Currently, the attendance for Frank List Park solely 602,000. 
uh, participations at, at Franklin's Park. There were 75,000 in 1983, 84. North Cabarrus Park and Camp Tien Spencer Park, 219,000, so double uh, 10 years ago uh, at this point. Just the numbers are growing and growing and people are utilizing these facilities. Some of the other highlights that we have, we, have, we are at our fourth year uh, for hosting the Cabarrus, uh, for these, the state senior games in Cabarrus County. So next week we have pickleball coming in to town and we had 904 participations last year for pickleball, senior games pickleball here in Cabarrus County. And again, that is next week and we will be hosting that Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday next week. So if it's something you have never seen before, 18 games going at one time and seeing seniors participating and, and playing pickleball is something to see. I think we are over 700 signed on participants for that next week, all over the state coming in. The Senior Centers won an award from the Area Agency on Aging uh, for the programs and activities that were hosted during the Older Americans Month in May. We opened a nine hole disc golf course at Rob Wallace Park with 18 tee pads. We had 1,800 trout stocked at Franklis Park, offering the, uh, the opportunity for people to fish and have the mountain feel in Cabarrus County for the second year. Uh, wildlife, uh, North Carolina Wildlife chose Franklis Park to be a host site for that and having over 700 participants try their hand at trout fishing here in Cabarrus County. In December and January. Staff and volunteers <coughs> identified over 200 species of plants and animals. 174 monarch butterflies were raised and released from our park system. We have a new LED sign now at the, at the Concord Senior Center to help us advertise programs and events and it's full color and it, it is clear enough to see that close from the road uh, of the programs and events going on and let people know that they need to have a part of that senior center and it is not just for those that are knitting and sewing. Our healthy concessions is something to really take a, a step back and look at. In 2013, we had 13% healthy concessions. That changed to 64% in 2018 as far as the amount of products that are, le that are classified as healthy uh, in 2018. But then to look at that, we've increased our healthy concessions but also our sales for those healthy concessions have increased as well from 24% in 2013 to 52% in 2018. So people are buying healthy concessions. And that is just at Franklin's Park? Correct. Also installation of PA systems in our vehicles and the park systems to help relay important information to our park patrons. Heaven forbid we have a, an emergency situation. This will allow us to communicate properly with our park patrons there in a very wide open area if need be. And we have many, many partnerships that we have worked with uh, as far as our, our tax program, uh, bringing on uh, the iFly participation programs and going indoor skydiving with our participants. Uh, and. Then just looking at the overall program numbers, we are offering over 4,000 programs in a year between the senior centers and the parks. With a, a full-time staff of 18, that's very impressive in our book. Does anyone have any questions or anything that I can answer for you? Just, I know Lana's last, last piece there that she had was the per capita cost back Actually, that was to eight, uh, 84? And you said the, In 83, it was $4.54. The per capita cost right now for both the senior centers and the parks is $10.84. The national uh, per capita cost is $76.44. And the state per capita cost is $65.54. We are at $10.84. I do have one last thing before you have any questions for Byron. 1985-86 land use plan. And you'll hear a lot of this has happened, maybe not in the time frame of which we anticipated. It's 1985-86. 
a North Cabarrus District Park land acquisition one to five years and development one to five years. It's developed, it just wasn't quite that time. Um, Harrisburg Community Park, of course we haven't done that. Midland Community Park, one to five years for land acquisition and development was 11 to 15, so we were close on that one. Unique areas, Cottle Creek Reservoir, Mount Pleasant Reservoir, and the Reed Gold Mine. Um, and open space greenway, Rocky River Greenway, Cottle Creek Greenway, Lake Concord Greenway, Cold Water Greenway, Three Mile Greenway, and Muddy Creek Green Greenway. And most of those were 11 to 15 years in development. Of course, the Carolina Thread Trail, when that came in 10, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, um, that took place of this, but I thought that was uh, pretty pretty interesting considering how many years ago that was and where we where we are at this point. I won't bore you with any more trivia. Well, I think it's very interesting. I'm trying to decide how to, whether that's an example of the really great job you're doing or if you're demonstrating to us how old you are. <laughs> Maybe both. Or both. <laughs> I think that's a good answer. But those, those are some, some very impressive facts. I think when we look at that per capita cost compared to the state uh, and, and, and the nation is, is very impressive. And our, our citizens should very much appreciate that. And we appreciate you all and, and the support that we get. And we wouldn't have any of this if it wasn't for you all. We do appreciate that as well as management. Okay. Any other questions just or one, comments? Yes, just sir. one comment. Um, Byron, are you going to have some more trout brought out this year? We have done everything in our power to ensure that we will be the site location for the trout again this year. Well, that's good. That seemed to bring out a lot of people to the park. Now about 1,800 you put in there. Now how many of them still in there? Uh, I don't <laughs> think we know that. But uh, We believe the, the, the last fish that was brought out was at the very end of January. So there's a lot of fishing between the end of December and the end of January. Well, I guess that probably depend on the weather. Let's just hope it's good so people can get out and enjoy the parks. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how well trout adapt to water temperatures, but according to what the Wildlife Commission said, if I remember correctly, the temperature wise, if they were in there, we would have found them now because, or a few <clears throat> months, a few weeks ago anyway, because they would not have lived. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to make a quick comment, and I was on the uh, commission board when we had a lot of discussion about healthy choices and of course the discussion centered around <coughs> is anybody going to actually buy this if we pr provide it and not to overstay but I mean that went on for I mean my time may be a little bit off but it, it wasn't just one quick meeting it, no. it, we talked about it for a long time so I'm I'm, and I'm glad to hear that 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 worked out because um, it was a tough decision to try to figure out well we're we giving up a revenue stream here and uh, uh, I think we responded to the marketplace and I think that's a good example of how uh, when people get together and have good ideas and map out a, a, a plan things generally work out in a good good fashion so uh, thank you for all your hard work and everything that, uh, that you guys do and in next year's annual report you'll see that we eliminated all soft drinks at Franklin's Park this year and have had only a couple of requests for them so we sold a lot of water and um, um, Powerade, Gatorade, those type things. I was just going to say I serve as liaison from the commissioners to the uh, Senior Center Advisory Council and make a lot of announcements but I mean definitely you guys I wanted to thank you for what you do. You've got a great board and most enthusiastic people I've ever seen and, <laughs> and Seniors is not the right word for them, but like I say, a lot going on there that if people are interested, they really should check it out. And I'm sure the parks as well. I'm just more affiliated with the senior side in more ways than one. So <laughs> encourage people to check it out. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the report. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have Robbie Furr for strategic plan draft review. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I'm excited to sit before you this evening and, and share with you an update and to bring to you our draft, our first draft for our strategic plan for 2020. Um, just a little bit of information um, as we bring the slide up about what got us here to this point. Um, 
this all started off, um, we, we kicked this off with your board retreat back in February. Um, and then in April through June, we held community workshops and staff workshops to gather input that would help to inform um, the you creating our strategic priorities and then us developing and drafting goals and objectives to meet those. Um, since then, uh, we held uh, a, a called session here for you on July the 29th where you worked to help to develop those strategic priorities and then put focus areas and prioritize those focus areas under those strategic priorities. We created five work groups made up of county staff and community partners. Um, so it was 82 individuals that worked together um, over a two-week period to draft goals and objectives for each of those five strategic priorities that I'll be sharing with you shortly. Um, that draft was reviewed by our county department heads on September the 17th. We gathered some input from them and made some refinements at that point. Then that refinement was sent to the county management. Um, they provided some more input and additional refinement to give you what I will be sharing <coughs> with you shortly. Um, so what I wanna talk about and what's gonna happen today is we're gonna go over um, this strategic plan, the document that we are in a draft form at this point in time. Um, and our goal today is to um, have you look and seek understanding for the goals that are, have been prepared for you so far. Um, the objectives that are listed under the goals are to help provide some clarity as the way staff can help to achieve those goals. Um, our goal for you though, um, after today, is that we will come back together in a more interactive session on before your board meeting on the 21st. We'll gather a little earlier that afternoon and have you help to finalize some refinement to these goals so that we can then create the final strategic plan that will then, will then be used to inform our work and county government. So let's just move forward with the first area. So we, we had five strategic priorities. I'm running the ship, here we go. Um, and those, as a reminder to you, are healthy and safe community, culture and recreation, sustainable growth and development, a thriving economy, and a transparent and accountable government. So those were the five strategic priorities um, that we worked with you to help to identify and then you placed focus areas underneath those that would help to um, guide our staff. So moving to the first strategic priority, which is a healthy and safe community. Um, and in that strategic priority, we have come up with four larger goals. And so I wanna go over what those goals are and just briefly outline how the objectives help to achieve that. The first goal is Cabarrus County residents will have a safe community to live, work, and recreate. So this goal focuses specifically on our law enforcement, and our sheriff's department, and the work that that department does to help to keep our citizens safe in, in the county. Um, those four objectives that are there focus on those law enforcement tools, um, customer service and efficiency, building community relationships, and then managing cost to be effective and provide quality service. So that is our first goal that we have under a healthy and safe community. Moving to our second goal, sustain a culture of safety where safety is a shared priority for our residents, businesses, employees, and visitors. And then the way that that work will happen um, is through community education, so public education on what we do and how people can become prepared when an, um, an emergency or a natural disaster should happen here in our community. Um, uh, uh, through building social capital and focusing on our infrastructure to strengthen the ways that we can become prepared for when those kinds of um, unforeseen circumstances can happen. And then finally, making sure that we are on top of trends and that we don't fall behind the changes that are happening, um, that we stay on top of our technology to keep our community safe. So this is our emergency preparedness goal. Our goal number three is improving the physical and mental circumstances of residents, residences by connecting them to community resources that enhance their quality of life. So this is our quality of life, healthy and safe community goal. Um, our objectives focus on partnerships in the community and our organizations to help meet those needs. Um, focusing on our household hazardous waste programming, our veteran services programming, and accessibility services for, for citizens with disabilities. And then our final goal for a healthy and safe community, 
reads, promote and engage quality of life initiatives to foster a healthy and safe community. So this is your physical and mental health goal. Um, in that area, fo we focus on collaborating with community members for evaluating their mental and physical wellness, um, looking at opportunities for physical activity and nutrition education, um, looking at behavioral health services that are provided here in our community, our outreach and communication and education to our citizens, and then early education to our youth and parents in the areas of mental health and substance abuse. So those are our four goals that the team has come up with and to help to um, meet the strategic priority of a healthy and safe community. Do you have any questions about those goals? I know we're hitting you with it first here, but I wanted to see if, if we need to seek some clarity at this point. All right, we're gonna move on. Our next area, the second priority, is culture and <coughs> recreation. And in this area, we have one of the, the very first goal reads, create a community that recognizes the basic human need for physical and mental development. So this is your social and interpersonal skills type of goal to help in our areas of, of, of culture and recreation. We'll do that through providing open dialogue in the community to um, engage and connect our diverse populations, um, our internal and external programming that we offer here, and then promoting the value and the wide array of arts education and how that helps to strengthen our community. That is our first goal. Goal number two, facilitate recreational opportunities that promote wellness in Cabarrus County. So this is a, a large majority of the work that happens in our active living and parks department. Um, the, this is done through addressing safety in our programming and in our facilities ensuring programming is inclusive of all of our citizens, um, identifying community needs and making sure we can meet those wellness needs, and then our larger objective of becoming a premier um, provider of recreational programming in Cabarrus County. Our, our next goal, which is our final goal in the area of culture and recreation, reads, enhance policies, facilities, and land to foster a diverse cultural and recreational opportunities. So this focuses on our assets, what we have, and where, we, where are we providing the culture and recreational opportunities here in our county. So our objectives are, are in the areas of land acquisition, um, amenity, uh, developing an amenities master plan and facilities master plan, um, focusing on strategic partnerships to meet our demanding our programming demanding needs and then also looking at um, developing sustainable and reliable funding sources for these kinds of needs and to support our facilities in our community questions seeking clarity about the goals these three goals in the area of culture and recreation all right sustainable growth and development is our fourth priority or our third priority. And in this priority, we have three goals that have been created by our, our team. The first one is, is focuses on our ordinances, our zoning ordinances and, 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 and the such. And that goal reads, administer ordinances compliance with the North Carolina law. This is a fairly straightforward um, goal. And this is done through community education on what it is that the county does and what is that municipalities have control over when it comes to ordinances and growth. Um, monitoring any changes that North Carolina legislature makes that could affect our, our ordinances here and making sure that those are um, kept current. And then maintaining community property values um, th through those ordinances and making sure that we keep our community vibrant and our aesthetics are where they need to be as a result of that. Our second goal reads, promote responsible and strategic countywide growth. And this happens through collaboration with our municipalities. It happens through understanding how um, growth needs to happen with, result, with regard to where utilities are located um, and understanding the school's construction design guidelines um, collaboration with our jurisdictions, um, understanding about our solid waste disposal needs, in particular with the landfill and what that is going to look like in the future, 
um, and then uh, minimizing our impact in the, to the environment with regards to growth that happens in our county. Our final goal under the area of strategic, of sustainable growth and development is to promote, support, and address sustainable open space, forestry practices, and farming. So this is our agriculture and environmental services type of a goal. That's done through um, education and promoting the understanding of agriculture in our community, um, letting our landowners and residents understand the, the opportunities in present use value taxation, um, and those kinds of things, and also becoming a role model for sustainability and how we conduct our business here. Questions about those three goals in our priority of sustainable growth and development? Yeah, I have one quick one. Yes. Uh, on objective number two, I believe the design guidelines was a joint document approved by both boards. So if that's the case, that needs to be clarified that the document we're talking about is that one that yes. both boards has, have had uh, input on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, our fourth strategic priority is a thriving economy, and this priority has two goals attached to it. The first is to promote, grow, grow and sustain a diverse economic base through collaborative community partnerships. This is our business-focused um, goal in, in the area of a thriving economy, and that is um, understanding and using incentives, incentives for competitive recruitment, um, understanding the importance of business, businesses providing competitive wages to relocate into open businesses here, and then also creating public awareness and understanding of what economic development means in Cabarrus County. The second goal is more of a workforce focused goal and it reads invest in opportunities that promote self-sufficiency and empowerment to our current and future workforce. So that goal um, will be achievable through apprenticeships and training programs, tra transportation to CTE programs in our high schools, um, attracting businesses and, and employers that provide um, skilled labor, competitive ben um, incentive packages, and then prioritizing those businesses and, and, and helping to build a community that is attractive to businesses and, and having them want to, to relocate here. So th those are our two goals under a thriving economy. Any questions about those? All right, and finally, transparent and accountable government. And this one has five goals attached to it. Um, the first one is our um, workforce human resources goal. It reads to ensure an engaged and accountable workforce to provide exceptional service. This is done through recruiting technically trained employees, um, making sure our workforce is diverse, providing competitive compensation, providing um, opportunities for development, and increasing employee engagement in our community. Goal two is our financial goal, our money goal. Um, that reads to perform financial analysis, forecasting, and reporting to ensure efficient and effective stewardship of funds. That work will happen through um, safeguarding our assets here in the community, in our county, um, utilizing a fair um, opportunity and ways that we assess property values, um, using best budgeting practices to manage our funds, and then communicating and informing our stakeholders on how we manage our funds. Goal three reads um, to ensure longevity of current and future assets. So this is um, again, focusing on our buildings, our facilities, and the things that we own in our county as county government. Um, looking at these areas, we'll do that by um, understanding the total cost of what it is to own and manage and maintain land and facilities and assets in our county, um, evaluating uh, operating expenses per square foot, looking at techniques and strategies to increase our, to make our efficient, to increase efficiencies in our facility operation, um, promoting more collaboration in our community to have shared spaces and strengthen relationships with partners to help to meet our, to meet our needs and their needs. Goal four 
is creating opportunities for people to find value in the work of county government. This is our citizen engagement goal. Um, so facilitating interactions with respect are how we interact with our citizens, um, our customer service, our community education and ways that citizens can become involved in government, um, motivating citizens to see themselves as part of the process, and then also providing clear, relevant and timely information to our citizens on what it is that we do here in, in the government. And then our final goal for us transparent and accountable government is to develop creative technological solutions to support county services. So this would be done through um, being strategic and informing our decisions um, based on intentional data sets and then making sure that we are collaborating and that we can't do it alone and our, our partners, non-governmental partners and other governmental partners, how we can partner together to be efficient and share our resources. So those are our five priorities with our goals and objectives tied to those. That's a lot of information for us to share with you at this moment. There were 17 goals and 65 objectives attached to this at this point. What your um, task will be between now and the 21st over the next two weeks is to take this five page document that is not 88 pages um, to review and, and, for, and to seek more clarity on. Um, ask questions about what that means. So if there's information in that document that you need more clarity on, then seek that clarity through, um, through Mike Downs, through myself, through members of staff, and we can help you understand that better of what those types of, what the words mean and what, where are we going with those goals and objectives. And record your recommendations. Where do you see are there goals that we could be combining? Or perhaps be more strategic about what it is that we're doing with that. We're gonna come together, you will come together, on the, on the 21st to take that document and refine it even further. Um, the goal is for this document to be um, strategic and intentional. It's, uh, the, the goal of this strategic plan is not to encompass everything that we do in Cabarrus County, but instead to, um, to target what it is you as a board want us to focus on for the next three to five years. Where is our intentional work and how can departments work to make that happen? So that is what we want to make sure we pull out of this process with you on the 21st. So yes. is that going to happen at our regular meeting on the 21st, or is there something scheduled before no, that? So we're, we're going to ask you here shortly to, to come in and do another workshop like you did prior a month or two ago, do an hour, hour and a half session prior to, and then go into your regular meeting. That way you can uh, sit around and, and have those conversations instead of sitting up at the dais. Yes. Okay. Okay, and I would just commend you for taking 80 pages of what appeared to be front and back and put it in such a nice, short, concise, understandable format. So uh, that was a lot of work. And, the work of um, 85 wonderful individuals pages. in our community. I saw them and I remember reading them. So I'm very impressed and very appreciative that you were able to take it and put it in this format for us to move forward with. So thank you all for that hard work. Right. Any other questions or comments? I certainly agree. You've uh, taken a l large amount of information and very effectively diluted it down to the important points. Yeah, so as you read through this this week and study it a little bit more, feel free to, to reach out to us and with comments ahead ahead of time. And if not, just uh, you know, have them ready for next for, for two weeks from now. <coughs> very good. Thank you. Yes, thank you very is, much. Is that appropriate and are you available two weeks from today that would be prior to your regular what meeting? What are you thinking, Mike? 5, 5.30, something like that? Um, I don't know. The Mike. session, your meeting starts at 6.30, right. so we were thinking uh, 4.30 to 5.30 or 4.30 to 6 o'clock. Uh, an hour, hour and a half is tops is what it's going to take to make this happen. And I won't come, be coming back from out of town, but I should if I'm late, you know, but I'll, I know I'll be back by 6.30 and I'll do my best to be back by whatever time we set. But if I'm running a little late, you know, you can't predict traffic. Yeah, and if you, except yeah. if you want to send some, yeah. some of your comments or concerns mm -hmm. or, or yeah. whatever prior to. But I feel like, I, I mean, I should be back barring no, nothing that's in my control. 
Yes, and, and I have another commitment at 4.30, which was one that I was supposed to be at at 6.30 that I said I couldn't be there because we had a meeting. So it should not be too long. So I will just might miss the first portion of that discussion. That should be fine. I'm okay. I'm just 4.30. Very good. And definitely, um, you are welcome to send your feedback ahead of time, and that way we can have that information and begin to start to process that, and that makes that session move even quicker to a final product. All right. All right. Will do. Thank you. Okay. We move now to item 3.4 from Cabrera Serena and Events Center presentation of their annual report and we're delighted to have Kenny Robinson with us. Thank you all. It's uh, it's hard to believe that Cabarrus Arena has been open for almost 17 years. We're within a month of our 17th anniversary of our opening day and SMG has been proud to operate Cabarrus Arena Event Center now for 14 years and I can tell you that fiscal year 19 was by all accounts the best year we've ever had operationally. I'd like to share with you a few highlights about numbers of events, revenue, um, service, uh, reports on the service level we provided, things of that nature. And we'll start by our records. Um, we're charged with really three key performance areas is it there to increase revenue increase the number of events and decrease the operating deficit of the venue and these are some records we set in fiscal year 19. food and beverage sales uh, seven hundred and sixty six thousand uh, dollars that's a bunch of hot dogs and chicken tenders and uh, chicken on buffets um, it was a 23 percent increase over the last year fiscal year 18 and it was a hundred thousand dollars better than any single year we'd ever had in the venue's history. And last year was not the record setting year. We had to look back to, I think it was 2015 or 2016 uh, to find that record. Gross revenue, uh, a new record, $2.3 million. That does not include ticket sales that went to an artist or to a performer or to a show promoter. That's revenue that was generated at the facility that stays here in Cabarrus County. Bottom left, uh, 81 midweek events, and I'm going to define a midweek event as something that is fully contained Monday through Friday. If there's a weekend component at all, if it uh, starts on Friday and finishes on Saturday, that's not a midweek event. It's things that really happened uh, Monday through Friday. Had 81 of those last year, 23% over increase over fiscal year 18 and 18 was the record at the time and last year we did 201 events different events at Cabarrus Arena and Event Center and in addition to that we did another 17 off-site caterings uh, for Cabarrus County whether it was here in this building uh, the DSS building other locations in the county so 201 events uh, plus 17 off-site caterings uh, that were not recorded as events it was uh, an 18 and 18 percent increase over uh, 2018 and that was the record at the time in 18. Kind of a, a difficult to read graph here. This is the last 10 years. The, uh, the orange section of the graph is gross revenue, that $2.3 million figure I mentioned just a second ago. If you look back to fiscal year eight, the, the dotted orange line was where we were in fiscal year 08 adjusted for inflation. The solid orange line is where we've actually been every year. So you see we've, uh, we've exceeded inflation by a good margin in those 10 years. The, uh, the bottom line, the blue portion, is our operating deficit. The venue does operate at a deficit. It's gotten better every year. If you would look back to 2008 and adjusted 2008's figures by the inflation rate, you'd get the dashed blue line. The solid blue line is where we've actually been. 2019 was not a record year uh, if, as far as minimizing the operate, operating deficit. It was the third best year and we didn't miss setting a record by much. Back up one slide. I 
went forward too much. The last five years, this is the number of events. If you look back to uh, fiscal year 15, we did 128 total events at the venue. 18, fiscal year 18, we did 171. Last year, I said we did 201 plus those 17 uh, catering events uh, for Cabarrus County government. There is one error on here. We made an 18% increase, but if you look back and compare fiscal year 15 until 19, it's 57%, not 36%. Huge increase. Midweek events, we look back for the same five-year time period. In 2015, we only did 34 of those. Last year, we did 81 that I'd mentioned earlier, 66 the year before, so a 23% increase year over year, 138% increase uh, in the last five years. And all of this was done with basically the same staff. Uh, I think we've added one full-time position in the last seven or eight years. Um, it's getting challenging to do this number of events. and, and the, the level of events we're doing has changed. It's uh, a much higher demand from a service standpoint. We're doing a good job with what we have, but we are a lean staff. This is a tough graph to read. Um, it, it gives a little of comparison about the different event types we host at Cabarrus Arena. Uh, the, the blue bars are the number of event days. Uh, orange bars are attendance, and the uh, gray bar is the profitability of those events and you can see on the far left consumer shows this is things like Christmas Made in the South uh, the annual home and landscape show uh, they contribute most of our attendance most of our profitability uh, and most of our event days assemblies um, is dominated by high school graduation and Rowan Cabarrus Community College graduation uh, those are done at cost uh, to those clients uh, but they're huge attendance drivers Cabarrus County Fair is, is no revenue source really for Cabarrus Arena, a huge attendance component um, and a few event days, but it's its own separate entity. We just have to report these uh, statistics. And, and I didn't mention attendance. Last year, we were about 295,000 people came to Cabarrus Arena, a few short of our all-time record. Um, and a lot of that was because of the rain uh, with the hurricane for the fair last year probably affected the fair, probably 30,000 or so attendees. If, uh, if we'd had those days back, uh, it would've been a record setting year for attendance. Sporting events, uh, those are amateur wrestling, um, cheerleading competitions, things like that. A pretty good source of uh, events and revenue for us. Entertainment, those are concerts, um, professional wrestling, a sizable component, uh, performing arts, uh, predominantly dance competitions in our environment. Social events are wedding receptions, uh, birthday parties, anniversary parties, uh, meetings or traditional business meetings. Uh, that big jump to 81 midweek events came in that business meetings category over the last year. We made some changes in our marketing approach and saw some good results with that. Some things we're going to continue in fiscal year 20 and probably the first part of 21. And other events are everything else you can think of that doesn't fit one of these other categories. Things like dog shows, um, movie in the woods, things like that. Our sales folks, um, we know for certain they answered 1,521 sales calls or sales requests. We probably missed 150 or 200 of those, so the number was probably bigger. We know it turned into 201 events, but what happened to the other 1,300? Uh, the big blue line at the bottom, 45%, uh, didn't turn into to events for us because we just simply did not have the dates available. With only so many buildings to go around and so many weekends, it's tough to find dates for big events. The other, uh, the distribution is a lot like we see every year. Uh, the location of the venue has something to play, particularly with uh, concerts and consumer shows, although it's becoming less of an issue for us. Uh, venue pricing sometimes is an impediment. Uh, food and beverage pricing sometimes is. The outside catering policy, um, we only allow food and beverage service that we provide in the venue. That's not a huge issue for us, except some folks that may want to do a birthday party or a wedding reception uh, and use their own caterer. We try to keep that in-house with our own uh, catering staff because we know the quality. We know that, that we can provide an exceptional product at a reasonable cost. And, and then the orange part, the, uh, the other, is everything that we couldn't readily identify as one of these other 
uh, five categories. <coughs> this is something, these uh, guest survey results, this is uh, in a, a total of the last three years uh, that we've done this. Any Ticketmaster show, so think uh, professional wrestling and concerts at Cabarrus Arena, anyone that buys a ticket through Ticketmaster gets an email from Cabarrus Arena that says, hey, how about rating us on uh, these seven, uh, seven categories? And there's probably a total of 45 questions that make up this. Uh, the big numbers, and this is a 10-point scale, the big numbers you see we're in the high sevens, middle eights on everything, uh, the... Uh, the middle section in all of turnkey intelligence and they have NFL stadiums and NBA arenas and, and really big venues. Uh, the middle set of numbers are the best in the country at each of those categories. And then the, uh, the bottom set is SMG as a company as a whole, how they perform. Um, we have noticed that large, well attended events we tend to have lower scores on some of these, particularly on the arrival and the departure categories. We essentially have one way in and one way out of the venue and it, big crowds, it makes a difference. We do see a little bit in the, uh, in the environmental section uh, for big crowds and that's typically because of, uh, we'll get comments like the seats are too small or it's too crowded or it's too cold in the building. And we actually do have to make the building about, say the arena, about 65 degrees when folks walk in. So it'll still be 70 degrees when they walk out three hours later. So it is cold when you get in there and we know that and understand that. A few other ways we're measured, our, the quality of our service is measured is uh, on the left, the good old fashioned Google by business account. Folks can go on and make any kind of comment and rate us on any sort of way they want to. Um, we averaged 4.36 stars out of five last year. The year before it was like four and a quarter, 4.24, something like that. Uh, you see 59% of ours were five star ratings. And the comments we got were typically a lot like that, that last survey uh, slide I showed. Things about traffic, uh, things about it was too cold, it was too warm, seats were too crowded, that sort of thing. On the right side, this is our clients. These are the, the results of surveys from people that actually sign contracts to host events with us. Um, this is typical of what we've seen every year. The overall impression from those folks were either 100% satisfied or very satisfied. The bottom part, uh, would you recommend us? 98% was most definitely, 2% probably not. And that was because of the location. And what's interesting about that that was the second time that event had been at Cabarrus Arena and it wasn't a problem three years ago. So it looks like they put the wrong event at the wrong place, they needed a little different marketplace. Um, but that is the first probably not we've seen in several years. A few more accomplishments in, uh, in 2019, we added 47 new events. Now about half of those were weddings and birthday parties and anniversary parties that you would expect to have uh, new from year to year. Uh, we added three outdoor events, a couple of those were car shows, but one was an outdoor movie that was very, very successful. We had our first sold out concert in the venue's history in March with a Casting Crowns concert and that was the first legitimate every seat in the venue was sold for that concert. We've done other concerts that were close, but that's the first one we can really point out and say that was an official sellout. We co-promoted our first concert and a, a co-promotion is the venue absorbs some financial risk. Um, we will not lose money, but we can absorb some risk in return for a promoter taking a chance to host a, a date with us that we normally wouldn't get. Gary Allen concert was on a Thursday night in, I think it was November of last year. First time promoter, we would not have gotten that date if it had not been for us taking some risk, um, supporting that promoter uh, into taking a chance on Thursday night. We did not uh, make quite as much of a profit as we would have if it would have been a Friday or Saturday night, but we wouldn't have gotten the date to begin with if we couldn't have done it on a Wednesday or a Thursday night. Those, uh, those two concerts I mentioned, uh, the Gary Allen and Casting Crowns, were two new promoters. And uh, since then, we've had both, of, both those promoters call trying to find dates. I've got a couple holds for one now, and we just have not been able to make a date work for the other one. 
In 2019, we began work on the venue self, first ever self-promoted event. That's where we're taking 100% of the risk um, in underwriting an event. We're doing it with our partners at Active Living and Parks. Uh, it's called Touch a Truck. Uh, that, that event's actually gonna take place this Saturday, rain or shine, and I've gotta do a little promotion um, at Cabarrus Arena from nine until one. It started with uh, Byron Hegler and I were talking about another event we were doing together and he said, uh, hey, I went to a really neat event in the last couple of weeks. What do you think about doing one here? We, we kept talking and uh, we, the arena, are venue managers. To create content, to create more value for, for the county, we need to learn how to be event promoters and that's not something we do. Active living in parks do that all the time. I think Byron mentioned there was 4,000 and some uh, programs that happened in the last year. They know how to do that on, a, on the scale they're used to. We tagged up with Active Living in Parks. Uh, we're learning everything we can about being event promoters from them. In return, they're using the venue and we're using, contributing some advertising, some marketing money, and some day of show staff. I can tell you that Cabarrus Arena has learned um, we're not ready to be 100% in the spotlight concert promoters. We've, we've got some learning to do still. Uh, I think with two or three smaller events, we'll be there and in a year, 18 months time, I think we'll be able to, to say we're ready to take a chance on promoting some shows in-house, um, some, some higher risk shows than we're talking about with this uh, Touch a Truck event. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, last year we had 20 nonprofit groups uh, take, take part in fundraising opportunities at Cabarrus Arena. Those are groups that generally work in concession stands or help us with traffic control or cleaning up trash. Uh, participation was down. Uh, the year before we had 22 events, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, 22 groups. This year we had 20. Uh, the amount of money they collected went down as well. What we're seeing is the nature of those groups are changing a little bit. There's not as much participation within the groups themselves as there used to be and uh, we've got something scheduled later uh, later November to talk to them about ways to increase their participation to get it back up where it was four or five years ago where it was still uh, 20 groups but probably a combined total of $75,000 a year went to the work they did instead of the 20 or so thousand that we did this past year and the bottom number is is impressive um, the arena afforded $785,000 in fee discounts or contributions to community partners, nonprofits, governmental associations to host events at Cabarrus Arena and Event Center. This was not discounts given to for profit businesses. These really were community partners um, hosting events to make community a better place that would have been funded uh, largely by taxpayers either in Cabarrus County or one of the municipalities uh, to begin with. And I'll close by saying that we really did have a good year. It was the best year we've had. Um, 2020 looks to be very strong. I'd like to be in this same place next year saying that it was another record setting year. Um, I'm optimistic, um, but I'm also a little bit of a pragmatist to say last year was, was tough to be. Thank you, sir. Great, thank you. Any questions for Kenny? Can we go back to the, the, the net income graph? Because that's not in our program here. Okay. So that's the first time we saw it. Okay. And that I one. didn't, yeah, that one. And so so it, the, the bottom blue line is net income. That's the operating deficit. If you would look back at 08, the, the dotted blue line is if you took whatever the real experience was in 08 and adjusted it for inflation, the consumer price index uh, for the last 10 years, that would be the dotted blue line. We're under that significantly, so in real money terms, uh, we're exceeding where we were. We're doing better than where we were in 2008 by, I don't know, somewhere in the quarter million dollar range. Okay, so that's it. The, the left side, those are negative numbers? Negative numbers. Okay, well, I missed that. Yep, right. yep. D down into the, the blue one, down, uh, going down is good. Yeah, last year we were at negative 473, I believe it was. Uh, 
I may have it. 473, 166. That's it. And we've been okay. high, as high as the 670s okay. in the past. So we've closed the deficit from, so you. I may have that, bear with me just a second. In any event, it's trending the right way, the, the good correct way. way. Yeah, we we are. Any input thought on how to close that gap any further? Obviously, if you do take a look at some of the analysis, you start start weighing the events that you make money versus the ones you don't, and you try to trend that. Now, I know we've had discussions before about not taking some of the things that we have historically done and just kicking them to the curb. You're right. And I, in, in the big picture, that, that, that certainly has to be part of the, be the equation. But I just didn't know, as your analysis goes through, which ultimately ends up being what we have to decide to do, uh, any thoughts on how to, to, to what, continue to close that gap? What you said is one of the, the key components. Uh, look at the, the book of business that we have and decide are there some events that have been good to us they're good partners but maybe they need to be displaced put in a different spot a, a less high demand time of the year the trouble we're seeing is we're getting to be high demand all the time um, and making a judgment of how far out do we extend event contracts we have some folks that are I, one's wanting to do a 10-year term if they can do it. And I don't know if that's the right way to go. Um, we can potentially do three-year contracts and be able to revisit it. We're raising rates as we go. We're at least matching um, inflation. This past year, we raised our, our base rental rates, and that's not a huge component. It's only about a half million dollars a year, um, but it's still 20 percent of, of what we do we raised those 15 percent this past year didn't phase anyone so we're probably a little under where the market is right now and our plan is at the start of every fiscal year to go ahead raise those rates raise our labor rates raise our equipment rental rates and raise our um, concessions and catering rates to still be below what you see 20 miles away in Mecklenburg County but still be more competitive, uh, generate more revenue than we do now. Um, I don't know what the, the threshold really is. Will that $473,000 become 200000 or do we break even? Unless there's a, a major change in the marketplace and one of those really could be the development of a hotel. There's some signs that have gone up on property adjacent to Cabrera Serena um, about potential development for a hotel. That would change what we do dramatically. Um, then we become a uh, seven day a week, you know, 50 week a year operation at that point. And uh, just the food and beverage alone would, would make that deficit change dramatically, go down dramatically. The other thing that looks odd, and, and I don't know, maybe, but the fare, the income, I mean, it's literally zero. And that just on a graph looks very strange. That's but that's to the arena. That's to the arena. To the arena. We our fare is totally separate. Okay. In, our, in our contract negotiations there, that was pre-existing. And so when we negotiated those contracts several years back, that the arena would still, they actually lose revenue because they're, they're, they're dark on those, those two, really two weeks out of the year. They're dark. They can't put anything out there. Right. Okay. Yeah, it, it yes. really is revenue. No. Because yeah. we've tied it up. Yes. Uh, under yeah. Okay. Correct. Well, and I just the not showing any gray there just looks odd, but that it, right. that makes it, sense. Se separate department and the fair does ask us from time to time to do some things <coughs> for that event, and we bill the county at whatever our actual out-of-pocket cost is. So it's it's not a revenue generator at all. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I I just wanted to make a comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. That is, um, I wasn't obviously on the commission at the time when the arena was built and all of that was done. Well, obviously, we had a huge overhead there with debt service and all of that, which that's going away. I'm assuming that's going away practically, maybe even getting Very close soon. to being gone. So that's a good thing. But I, I as for my own self, um, I, I don't know that we'll ever see a break-even point, you know, money's brought in, money's spent, that type thing. 
I've sort of always looked at it as a quality of life amenity for Cabarrus County citizens. For them to have somewhere to go, have events that they want to come to versus going across the line this way or that way or some other way and keep our people at home. And of course that doesn't even mention the tax dollars that's generated from you know, whatever goes on out there uh, during the different uh, events and all. But uh, to me though, it was a quality of life issue and uh, you know, but I think if we can possibly bring it closer to a net zero, that would obviously be better. But I think the ultimate goal though was uh, a uh, community asset and a quality of life for our citizens. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. The only suggestion that I would offer, you talked about those um, outside catering events. You, you might include that as part of your annual report next year. Okay. To bring I the understand. Ca ca catering. You I do understand. A, you do an excellent job. I understand. We, we always appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up, 3.5, update on synthetic turf playing fields. And the county manager will I'll, talk about that. I'll start off real quickly and then, then pass it on to Jonathan and I think uh, Brian. Yeah, come on up, Brian. Uh, and as you remember, um, Ms. Carpenter from the Convention and Visitors Bureau was here a few months ago. Um, and, well, I guess it's started even before then. As you know, the county gets a portion of the revenues uh, for uh, sports facility development uh, through, through the revenues that are generated through the Convention and Visitors Bureau. And we've, we've used it on some smaller projects over the years, but we've been trying to, to um, hold those revenues for several years in order because the projects are getting more expensive. Uh, so we currently have somewhere between, I think it's 1.6 and 1.7 million in that account right now. Um, and we don't have a project identified and that's when Ms. Carpenter come to us and she's trying to, and, and John in the back back there, he's, he's the sports uh, salesperson over there as well, manager, and, and trying to sell Cabarrus County, uh, we need some more facilities and we need a more diverse set of facilities. Uh, and then right now there is a market for synthetic field sports uh, that they can use all year round. Uh, and what we're proposing to do is to really help the school system by going out uh, with that money and, and turfing two of their existing fields. Uh, and that would allow, allow them to have uh, the synthetic fields to play on, but then also allow the Convention of Visitors Bureau to sell those fields when the schools are not using them and that will open up uh, Cabarrus County to several new sports, would be football, would be ultimate frisbee, uh, lacrosse, uh, that uh, typically don't have the space or, or don't really like to play on the, on the, the natural turf fields. So we're, we're looking now uh, to, to present to you and then also to the, uh, the school, the schools, uh, the Board of Education, as well to, to move forward with this. Uh, I know the, the Visitors Bureau would like to have two more fields, uh, not necessarily stadium fields, but two more just uh, multi-purpose fields in a location, whether it's on school property somewhere, is it Franklin's Park, or is it a whole new location uh, to add to that. So as you know, uh, Central Cabarrus has a, an artificial turf field. The new high school will have an artificial turf field. With these two fields, that would be four stadiums with art artificial fields. Uh, and we need to, we're looking for two additional multi-purpose fields um, and that would be an additional amount of money that we would have to raise the convention and visitors bureau is, is committed to make uh they're discussing now and hopefully would be to commit those additional revenues for future for far into the future that we would collect and pay the pay those those costs over the next several years um, so i'll turn it down over to to jonathan and brian as the, and they can talk to you about the actual work that's actually been done so far and, and how do we get these fields built and what and, and what's the process because there's a tight timeline if we're going to make this happen within the next year or so. So that really is the beginning of the discussion is that we, we pulled a group together in September with, with the schools, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, county staff to begin to look at this and our goal would be to try and, and get these two um, stadium facilities done over the winter 
between sports seasons, which again is a very tight time constraint. So Rodney's going to talk to you a little bit about procurement methods that may be necessary or that we can use in order to do that. But we've already had ongoing discussions. Um, of course, West Cabarrus High School, that field has been installed, and if you have questions about that, Brian can answer those. And um, there's a lot more to installing one of these fields than just rolling out carpet and putting in a substrate. There's, there's drainage issues. There's concrete curbing issues. We've, we've had some discussions about can you also upgrade track facilities while you're doing this. Um, there's a number of things involved with that. Um, so it is a difficult both engineering and then procurement process um, to get all that done at the same time. So phase one, as Mike said, would be to look at two high school stadium facilities, Cox Mill and Robinson, and getting both those done. And then phase two would be looking at two additional fields that are outside the um, the stadium itself and could be used for these same tournaments. Um, and John is here, may want, want to speak to um, booking events, but one of the reasons we have such a tight time frame is they are looking at the possibility of booking some events for, for next summer. So that would be why we're trying to do this so quickly. Again, um, we are working now with a, or moving to a smaller working group to kind of keep this moving forward. Um, there's already been some discussions with um, the particular installer or menu, I guess it's the installer, mm -hmm. not the manufacturer, um, to, to see about putting in similar fields because there is a benefit to the schools to do similar fields because they're going to ultimately be maintaining those. They're also going to be in discussions with the schools about a use agreement just like we have in, in use of all the, the athletic facilities of the schools that we already have in place but this would be a separate use agreement because we're bringing in some outside groups and tournaments and that sort of thing. So. Project-wise, if you have questions or, or specifics about the synthetic turf fields or what these facilities look like, then, then Brian is here to answer those. And then Rodney can go over some of what we're talking about with procurement to, to help us move forward with this. So just real quick on the procurement front, as you can imagine, given the time frame, a traditional procurement approach would be problematic. Uh, trying to get a formal sealed bid process completed within a short four to six week window is very difficult. So what we looked at is some alternatives and the big one that is uh, we can apply in this situation is a group purchasing program. So these are national programs that are used by local governments. They competitively bid and award their contracts and so they still go through that same process that we would have gone through. And in this case, they went through that process in June of 2018. So it's a relatively recent bid. And so that's the proposal that we're putting forward is that we would move forward with that agreement, which allows us to use a local contractor uh, to do the work that the school system has experience with. I, and, I, and I guess to add to this whole conversation is, and I'm sure you may have already gotten them, um, but, but we're getting questions too, and I know the schools are too, is why these schools? Why are we looking at these stadiums? Well, again, First of all, there is no school money that's going towards these projects to start with to construct these fields. Um, and why these schools? Again, it's Cox Mill High School and it's Robinson High School, and then the new the new high schools already being built. Those are in those are the closest high schools to the hotels, and that's where these athletes that are coming in from all over would want to stay, and their families, their grandma and grandpa and mother and dad that are coming with them. Uh, they want to stay close. They want to cut those travel distances as much as possible. So those, uh, those are those are the reasons. And again, as Jonathan said, uh, the the why we're trying to or being asked to expedite the process is because John needs to be able to sell these, but he needs five to six, eight months out to to get events for next mm -hmm. year. So he's got to start selling it, but he needs to know that he's got fields that are going to be here before he can start selling Cabarrus County. So. Um, so there's two parts of the question, is, or two parts of the, the project. Two is, one is to get these two fields with existing money underway uh, to meet those deadlines. And then the other two would be uh, what the CBB is asking uh, and willing to commit to is that if the county would assume the debt and then sign a contract that the CBB money would continue throughout that process to continue to pay, that, to pay the county back. Uh, so there's there's two two separate ones there. Uh, there's two separate uh, scenarios there. One, the money is existing right now, 1.6 million. So just about all of that would 
hopefully that would cover the two fields, but then to build the additional two fields, um, they're asking for the county to take that on and then pay with, with the contract or formal agreement in place that their, their revenues would come back into hope. Pay the county back. And are they talking about doing all four at one time or? They would like to do, but I don't think logistically yeah. we can do four and we'll fields at one time. Yeah. So the stadiums would come first, uh, and then we would come back after we selected a location, whether it's already on an on a existing school site, or it's, to, or it's Franklin's Park, or, or if it's somewhere else in close proximity that we can put the two fields in. Yeah, so our concentration will be on those two stadium fields to do first, because um, that is the money we have in place. Um, and again, I, I, wanna, I know we're repeating a lot of things, but this is tourism money, so it has to be able to, once the mm -hmm. end result of this is to bring in events that generate tourism, mm -hmm. um, an event, you know, generate those room nights, and that, that's important. So that's why we're talking about both the um, synthetic turf fields, but the possibility if there are track events out there and we can afford to, to upgrade some of those, those track facilities, and that may be something we'll bring back to you as a proposal to, to do with this. But um, again, with speed and the time frame we have, um, there's engineering, there is installation of these fields, and there's a manufacturer of the synthetic turf itself, and these procurement groups that Rodney was talking about would allow us to um, enter a contract to do all those together, to do that engineering. So you'd still get the discount mm -hmm. or whatever, there's some multiples even though yeah, it'd be spread out. Mm -hmm. So we'd be using the same synthetic turf and have the same installer potentially with some of these procurement groups, but it's already been pre-bid, which helps us. So we will be bringing you back, if, if this, if you're still comfortable moving forward with this, we'll be bringing back different approvals that are necessary from you at different you know, commissioner's meetings in pretty rapid succession. And that goes all the way to those use agreements that we'll, we'll need to refine to make sure that we have all that buttoned down. Well, I serve on that board as well, and I know there's certainly a need um, for that. So I am okay as long as you have a method of where that money's coming from <coughs> in the meantime while we're getting it back, which I exactly. assume you do. Well, <laughs> we'll right. once you, you give us uh, um, the authority to move or the direction to move forward, we'll start looking at those different options. That's correct. I personally am good with it. I think we actually began similar discussions in 2012 or 2013. Um, so we've taken a while getting there. But when yeah. those two are done, there'll be seven total fields in the county counting A.L. Brown. Is that correct? There will be, there will be five. Central. Five. Well, five, but then when you do the two more, the two won't there be seven? Would be seven? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so in one option, you know, they would like to have them uh, on non stadium, but they could be two more high schools potentially. But they're trying to get four fields in one location. Uh, so um, that would be actually five, because those other, the new high school is, is close by as well. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, one of the things that concerns me about turf fields, I mean, I know that it's going to bring in people and bring in tournaments and all of that, and they're surely not going to last like some of our fields. Central field, prior to getting the turf, was 20, 25, maybe even 30 years old. And I'm supposing the life of the turf is, Brian, you might can, or Jonathan, somebody could say, the the life of the turf is what 10 maybe 12 years yeah, they said if, if it's installed correctly and maintained annually on the maintenance agreement you should get about 15 years out of the turf fields okay well you know over a period of time that's obviously a substantial investment seven turf fields at, when it's all done you're looking at what seven and a half eight million dollars and then when it comes time to start replacing those fields I don't know that it's going to cost as much but by then it may we say if we're paying a million dollars to do one now and in seven or eight years we have to start doing them again then that's going to be another million dollars that's going to have to be allocated for that yeah and i think th there are some cost savings as well with the turf i guess brian you could speak to what you've experienced i guess at some of the schools but the, the irrigation system is not necessarily needed other than to cool the field you'll still need one to cool the field down 
but uh, and the mowing of the grass and some of the other stuff. But Brian, you, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, and I don't know much from the facility <laughs> side and the the, the long-term maintenance that we have on our natural grass surfaces. But the advantages that you have of when it does rain, you can turn around within the hour and start playing on it. Whereas on a natural surface, you may have to wait another week, just depending on how much rain you've had. Um, you know, th again, there is a replacement cost that you would have to factor in from a capital improvement standpoint long term. Uh, but the replacement cost is considerably less than completely building a new field altogether. And you have to look at it that, that way too. And we've, we've also addressed with the company we're speaking with about a maintenance plan since we'll have so many fields in the area, letting them, you know, contract with them to, to perform a preventative maintenance plan with us uh, on all these fields. So. And I think that gets to part of what I was saying is they're much more complicated than just looking at the synthetic turf. There is a um, concrete curbing around this as basically the tax strip. That's mm -hmm. my, yeah. my non-professional way of looking at it. Um, there's quite a bit of subsurface work. It, it's crowned differently. There's, there's base work that has to be done. There's stone. There's a substrate under this. So you're not replacing all of that when you, when you do reach the end of its life. For the most part, you're replacing the actual synthetic turf that lays on top. It is the, the carpeting that goes on top of all that. So you don't have to redo all of that each time. Um, and then, as we said, there's an annual maintenance cost that, that is, is less because there is a, a much higher maintenance cost for all the different chemical treatment, watering, and everything you have to do, mowing, everything you have to do with the natural surface field. John, you want to come up and, oh yeah, what's, what's give the CVB's perspective on what the benefit of these stadiums are going to be. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things that um, generate some excitement for me here, which is obviously the opportunity to, to bring um, these turf fields to life with uh, sporting rights holders uh, that are out there. The, the four fields in one area um, is really to get the larger groups to come in, and, and we need that because when you go to a sports right holder, rights holder with four fields and you say one's here, one's here, and one's here, that's not as appealing because there's other destinations that are out there that have them all in one area. So that being said, it, it limits, if we don't have the four together, it inhibits me to get those kind of groups in here. Not to say that we won't, but it's just a tougher sell. Now with regards to the timing of this, um, we have Diamond Sports rebooking re uh, with us uh, with, the, with the anticipation that these two fields would be completed mm -hmm. at that time. What comes with that is the opportunity to generate other groups that they do. And I will tell you Myrtle Beach is getting the majority of that business and we can bring that back in. Now encompassed with all of that is the schools benefit as well. So we see this as a two-way street, one to bring a bit of an economic impact to the area, but also to give back to, to the schools. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I have no problem with what we're wanting to do because it's a lot cheaper than building the sports complex, which is something I think you was probably referring to. Right. And I've seen a lot of those, you know, and I know North Myrtle Beach has a huge one. And I don't know if it's turf or if it's regular grass or what, <coughs> but uh, you're looking at excess of $20, 25000000 million to do something like that. But then again, you could bring in huge tournaments and, you know, it more than likely would, you know, pay for itself over a period of time. But we've got a pretty sure thing with what you're wanting to do because we got the C V B money that's gonna keep coming anyway. Right. And so you know that's gonna and, and that's what is that what you was referring to, Mike, when you said uh, they'll pay us back. Is that they'll just yeah, be making the same contribution they are now, but it'll be designated for those fields first. Is correct. that right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. Well that's sort of what I was thinking, but uh, yeah, I think that it, uh, I, I have no issues with it. And my only real concern was when it comes time to start redoing these. And, and like you said, Jonathan, I know it's a complicated process, but the good thing is, is in a real simple way, I guess it would be like rolling up the old yes. and putting down the new. Mm -hmm. So surely it won't be as expensive to do that. And I like to always think ahead because that, will, that day will come and there'll be some other commissioners sitting here and they're going to be saying, what did we do? Or that was a good thing they done back then. And I hope it would be the latter. So, uh, but I'm in full support of it. Thank you. 
Okay, any other questions or comments? So do you have what you need from us to proceed uh, ahead? Yep. If it's a consensus that you're, you're uh, in support of the project, then we will continue on as we are. I see no one shaking their head no. So we will thank you. We updated as we move along. All right. Very good. Next up is item 3.6 from Infrastructure and Asset Management, Human Services Center Lease Renewal, Kyle Billifer. Uh, good evening. The owner of the Human Services Center building, Hughes Investments, has reached out to me to discuss the building lease renewal. Um, the current lease that we have expires on May 31st of 2022. The owner would like to extend the lease term to May 31st, 2029, accompanied with a CPI adjustment in 2022. There has not been a CPI adjustment since 2012, which was the, the start of our last renewal. Um, the owner has discussed with the county some large ticket improvement and repair items um, that they would like to do, which is typically what they do every time we do a renewal. They do a large ticket repair or replacement item. The last time we did one, it was the entire roof replacement. Um, this year, or for our next renewal, they're starting to discuss with us the parking lot surface, um, subgrade stormwater under that, the parking lot lights, and then also some significant upgrades in the patio area um, that need to be done just because the concrete is failing there. Um, so really what I'm looking at is, is some direction from the board on, on moving forward on another lease renewal for that building. Um, that is just over 100,000 square feet. Um, some of the CPI adjustments they're talking since the last time we did one in 2012 to now would be about 11 and a half percent. So if, if you're looking at starting to go that renewal process and lock it in, we'd kind of be locking ourselves in a rate that might be lower than what reality would be as if we wait to that point. So I'm just looking for some direction if you want me to move forward on those discussions with them. Of course, everything would again come in front of the board, um, but the county manager's office would just like so some direction on moving forward with that is, is there a certain amount of years that is too much or should we try to go more years? Um, everything is on the table right now uh, with the owner, but they definitely want to lock something in so that they feel more comfortable with some of these big ticket items they want to do, which are the repairs of the parking lot. Yeah, I, I think if, if, if you don't know, our, our per square foot rate up there is, is really low compared to what we could find anywhere else. Uh, what is the future of human services and talking with our director, uh, Ms. Calhoun, you know, we're, we're already starting to look at satellite offices out there, moving the social workers out and about and maybe flex spaces so it's not always the same person working in, the, in that office, but if they're out and about in the communities. The reason why we moved to Kannapolis in the first place was way back when was that's where most of the clients were. Uh, that's not the case anymore. The clients are spread all over the county. Uh, so it could still remain as a headquarters even if we don't even if we start looking at more satellite areas, uh, that's still going to probably, that square footage is going to be needed. Uh, if not, it can be used by others. Um, I think it's a long time to, to commit to. Uh, some, uh, and I guess, Kyle, can you speak to some of the improvements that they were supposed to have made on the last extension? Are they all in place? Yes, the biggest one was the roof. responsive to us? when storms come and there's buckets up there on the floors and trash cans and you're putting in hoses to drain the roof and since the first since the roof replacement yes every since everything since then they've been responsive um they're still they're not a local management company they're in south carolina we do have quarterly maybe semi-annually meetings with one of their representatives where we walk the facility um, even if we weren't to renew we would probably push the issue of the patio repair um, but I, I kind of wanted to get some direction. I mean, we will expire in 2022 one way or the other. So um, if we're not envisioning having something in place by then to move 100,000 square feet of operation, I'd, I would need some direction yeah. now to start having these conversations. Uh, I, I think if we, if we can't make it happen that quickly to replace it, so I think we need to do a, some type of an extension. Uh, if we do extend it, I think there, 
there needs to be some improvements on the inside that would be our cost, some upfits there to make it a little bit. Uh, uh, if you've been in the building, it's it's a tough place. Like you, you can't find your way around, uh, and um, and we, we just need to do some upfits over. If we're going to extend it out to 2029, then yeah, there will there would be some cost in there for us over the next few years to continue to upfit that space to make it a little bit uh, more inviting. I guess so. Is there any prospect in the foreseeable future, Mike, that we could do our own and not lease? I mean, uh, we've got land. Well, we we yeah, we don't have the land to do it right now. Uh, well, don't this property that we have up here? Couldn't we do something with that? I mean, our courthouse is how many hundred thousand square feet to courthouse? Oh, you mean the church? Two hundred forty. The just parking right lot here, over yeah, here? Yes. That yeah. is an option. It would have to go up pretty high. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I'm just trying to think out of the box a little bit. No, because believe me, obviously, I've, I've had those same conversations. You know, so I, I told it, but, Kyle the next building was going to be the human services, and we built it down Yeah, there. it would require okay. a parking deck, obviously, because that would take the building would take up the parking place. Right. All the parking places. Well, you'd build the deck underneath. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, I think, and then again, I'm thinking out of the box, and, if, and, if, and if, <laughs> you know, we've... Cabarrus County is a great place to live, and I had I have had so many people tell me, you know, why did you put the uh, human services in Kannapolis? People that live in Midland and Mount Pleasant on the far east, you know, that's a pretty good ways for them to drive to go there. Obviously, it's very convenient for um, Kannapolis and for Concord citizens, but for the outlying areas, it's definitely inconvenient for a lot of them. But anyway. Uh, I think with all the things that we got going on in Cabarrus County, with economic development, with the things that's potentially on the rise, and and with all the things that's going on, you know, that I wouldn't want to see us stretch it out to 2029. I wouldn't want to go, as for me, I wouldn't want to go beyond 2025. That's five years. That would give us five years to come up with a plan mm -hmm. and do our own if we can do it. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't disagree. Uh, I think it, we're just at such a large project. You've got this, the courthouse that's going to be a very large project. This is going to be, I guess, that amount of square footage. If we were to build one that, again, what what we will be coming to you soon, um, along with, with Mr. Calhoun, is what is the future? Is it, is it a large building again, or is it satellite offices? Um, because, like you said, the clientele is not focused in one location anymore it's coming from everywhere um, so is a centralized location good or is it a smaller centralized location with satellite offices all around the county uh, and those satellite offices would be flex offices we're, we're already doing it at the dream center you approved us to do that last year we're, we're upfitting a, a, a space over there now and that would have I think two two or three social worker workspaces over there and I make one or two may stay there all the time, but it'll also have some flex space for others to move around and be able to work out of that same location. So if, you, if you're not comfortable as, you know, as the collective board to, to go to 29, uh, we can go back and talk to the owner and see what, what is acceptable to them, but then we would need to start planning very quickly uh, um, <coughs> just from the, the, the the clientele and where they're coming from and what are we looking at what is the what is the social human services social services how do we how do we plan on um, doing those services in the future is it in the communities is it in one location and uh, well and you know there was some talk here right out of raleigh you know, about trying to regionalize human service also is that talk still on the table or uh, it is it's not it's still not it's not total region regionalization but that won't do away with the local office. It would just be oversight. Okay. Uh, so there would still be the need to have those physical facilities around. So uh, this was just for conversation, but they, the, I know the owner is trying to, is, is pushing Kyle a little bit to get, get an answer back to him. But if, if the answer right now is that you want to think about it, then we can take it back to him. I, I think we will have to stay another two or three years anyway, over, over and above this. But. So is that something you can give back? Mm -hmm. They might not like it right now, but that's okay. They can they can wait while we're still trying to play in. 
Just just thinking out loud, uh, I think, and when I've asked questions about this in previous discussions, the rate that we are paying on that building is significantly less than it would cost us if we owned it and were maintaining it and operating it. Is that is that an accurate yeah, I, statement? That, that, Kyle, you can answer that. I think Kyle's we, we, making we, a questionable well, the, face. The, the operational costs, I think, are going to be somewhat About. the same. It's just the, the, the I'll go ahead, Kyle, I'll let you. <laughs> we pay for all the utilities and the interior um, work that goes on, so all the HVAC, so 40 plus units, all the utilities. Um, they handle the exterior of the building, which mainly encompasses the roof. Um, we even pay the sweeping of the parking lot. Um, so no, you're paying right now, you're about um, $6.90 per square feet, I think mm -hmm. is what you're rolling out. Um, with what they're talking about increasing, you're going up to 7.7 .7 is what they're looking for, $7.70. So you're looking at annually right now, we're paying $720,000 annually. You're looking at going up to 800000 So I think more of the question, uh, uh, kind of you were phrasing it, is it, is it cheaper for us? We're paying a bulk of the operating expenses right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're carrying that on our general liability, the insurance for that building. That's how the lease is written. So kind of all the things that trickle down into owning a building, we have it. I think the question you're asking, would it be cheaper if we just owned the building, meaning would they just sell it to us? And I guess that, that would be looking at you're paying $800,000 a year. What would they sell us to it for? And, and how would that average out on return on in investment? I kind of think that's where you're going with it, right? Yeah, yeah just, just looking at the, the overall picture. Yes. Ownership versus leasing. Yeah. And, and we built the interior. I mean, they didn't build it. We built the interior. That's why the release rate was so low is because we, we leased a shell. And we built it. We designed it and built it. And, twice. Yeah, twice. And some places maybe two or three times to, to just because of <laughs> workflow and, and, and how things were going. So uh, we'll go back have to more discussions with our with the owner but then also with our human services folks and see uh, and really press press them on what it, what it, what does it look like in the future how do they see their provision of services in the future so i mean pending pending those discussions i really like the idea of having more satellite availability you know you mentioned folks in the outer portions of the county if we had multi-use facilities there you know we've talked about expanding senior services and library services on the west side of the county you know if, if we could spread those things out so that people don't have to travel to a central location uh, right. i think that would be very appealing to our citizens and maybe allow us to reach more folks okay thank you we have our direction we'll, we'll move it we'll move forward with that okay thank you thank you okay next item 3.7 innovation and technology report todd shanley and crew uh good evening i brought jack dodd our security administrator with us tonight he's going to do a presentation about uh, Cybersecurity Month. October is National Cybersecurity Month, and we will. Uh, he'll do a good job of uh, showing you that about that. But um, first, I want to talk a little about. Well, first, this kind of covers in the uh, much like you talked about in strategic plan that Robbie covered earlier. This is the technologies part of providing the safe community uh, with the idea that we're going to help people understand how to be safer when they're online. And then the other piece uh, that Debbie outlines often is the, this covers her goal of creating a culture of innovation by educating and empowering staff. Uh, so next slide. And then uh, also plugging this month's Employee Digital Book Club report. This, uh, this book is the Cyber Conundrum, How Do We Fix Cybersecurity? Obviously this is a, a, a very tech-centric book, but uh, it comes from a voice that is not uh, heavy tech and is written to address the problems that all of us are seeing with cybersecurity. So I encourage everyone to read it, and it's a, it's a quick read. The, uh, the quick tip is, is the, the reader is a little bit uh, slower on his delivery, 
Um, there is a way to swipe on Hoopla and speed it up to 1.25, and it makes it sound like uh, more of a natural speaker. So that was a little quick tip that we uh, put out there on the on the book club this month. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jack. Jack is a uh, is a great find for Cabarrus County. He is a he comes from us from uh, Davie County, where he uh, worked in the school system. Plus, he is a uh, NC State grad. He has a bachelor's uh, in electrical engineering, a bachelor's in computer engineering, and a master's in computer engineering from uh, NC State, I mentioned. So um, we are very blessed and lucky to have him on staff. He's been with us for about eight months now, and uh, he's already making a huge difference for us. So having said that, I'm gonna let him kick off with his, uh, his presentation. Okay, I hope I live up to expectations after that introduction. <laughs> So uh, it is October, it is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and what we're gonna do over the next few minutes, I'm try to be quick, is the Department of Homeland Security has su summed up cybersecurity into a simple phrase of own it, secure it, protect it. That is their mantra going into this thing this year. And I'll start with that own it component, which is, when we talk about owning your cybersecurity, that is a very abstract concept. And so this primarily is knowing your data. Everything I deal with in my job for cybersecurity ultimately comes down to dealing with data, who has access to it, how it flows around, etc. So the first step for anybody in their cybersecurity is to know that they know your data, know what's out there. Uh, just a couple examples I pull out are cell phone location tracking. Big deal nowadays because I know I use it, put my location on my phone, share that out with my mother whenever I'm going across the state on a trip so that they can see me and watch me on my trip, make sure I get there okay. It's a legitimate use of that data. I control it. I own it. Along the same lines, social media is ever present and ever expanding know what data you're putting on social media and this is especially true for the younger generation coming up through high school now understand the information that you are putting out there to the world and once you get a handle on that data and what you're putting out in cyberspace you've got to understand who has your data to play off my previous two examples your cell phone location probably belongs to apple google and maybe a couple other app vendors if you use them Similarly, your social networks, Facebook, Twitter, Snap Incorporated, et cetera, they have great leverage over the data you give them. And they take it, they hold on to it, and they use it. And the last piece is to know how your data is shared. So know how those companies are using the, your data and know how that data is being shared out. So for my, as I mentioned, find my friends, I love it because I've I forget to call when I get somewhere. And you can just look at my location and see that, oh yes, I did make it to Raleigh, okay. And then on the social network side, the sharing will be governed by a privacy policy and various user settings. It is incredibly, a very deep rabbit hole if you start going down all the different sharing settings that are available in just Facebook and then multiply that by the six or seven or so social networks the average teenager has, this is not an easy job. It's very complicated. And the Department of Homeland Security has put together some great resources to help with this. And so the next step, once you know where all this data is and know who has it, know what's going on with it. Ah, I forgot topic, sorry. So we call this the digital footprint. I need to, need to make sure I cover that. All this data, when it's out there in the web, termed it to be your digital footprint because that's kind of your mark you leave out in cyberspace. As I was getting to, once you know what your digital footprint is, where it's out there in cyberspace, the next step is securing that digital footprint. And so when we talk about securing data, we wanna make sure that only the people who need to have access to that information have access. And it would not be a security presentation if I did not talk at least a little bit about strong passwords. Um, ever since the 80s, how we generate passwords has been a point of contention. 
Some people like to take a, a phrase or word and do some capitalization, substitute some random letters, and that's their password. There's other strategies that are out there, but I'm gonna give you two examples up top. The first one is, as I was mentioning, the phrase, go canes, okay? Throw in a zero for an O, add a four or three, change the S to a dollar sign, and put an exclamation mark on the end. Looks like a pretty decent password, looks pretty hard to guess to a human. And then the one under it is a bit of a, a conundrum because it's, this is a really long password. All I did was put exclamation marks between all the words and mess with the capitalization just a touch. Between those two passwords, the one on the bottom is almost impossible to guess just because it is so long. It's very easy for a human to remember, very hard to guess. The password up top is about nine characters long. With modern graphics cards, I can brute force that password in about two days. Starting from nothing, just test all the combinations, we can guess that password in about two days. So the ultimate moral of the story on passwords is that longer is better. Make them long, make them easier, to, easy to remember. They can be sentences. And that in the last bullet up there for password management, we heavily discourage password reuse. So that's using the same password for multiple services. And I know even I'm guilty of it to some extent. But password managers are your friends. I know my mother likes to keep stuff written down in a notepad. And that is her password manager. It works for her, so I'm not gonna try to change it. But there are many an online service that's available to take your passwords, store them in a secure spot, and when you get to the website that needs that password, it'll auto-fill it in for you so you don't even have to worry about it. You don't have to remember it. It's all in that password manager. And so now that people are adopting these really long, really strong passwords, the bad guys turn to another tactic, and it's called phishing. And the core idea behind phishing is, can I have your password, please? It's really hard for me to guess it. Will you just give it to me? It sounds very simple when you phrase it that way, but that's what they do. They will send very specific, very crafted emails that look legitimate, and we'll put a link in that email that says, oh, your password's expiring, please click here to, to approve. And if you click there, it takes you to their website that might look like Amazon or Google or Apple. You sign in there and nothing happens, so it seems, but in reality, your credentials were just packaged up and delivered to a hacker with a bow on top. If anyone is in Cabarrus County, I guarantee, or anyone works for Cabarrus County government, I guarantee you, you have seen some of my fake phishing emails. I uh, send those out at least once a month. Um, I can brag on us for a minute. Our fish prone percent is rather low compared to our sector. Um, but on, for the general public, beware of links and emails. They are not always immediately obvious where they go. If you hover over them, they'll tell you where they go. And just be aware of them and don't trust them. We'll hear trust again in a minute. And the last point is using a second channel. So if you get an email that says, I'm from Netflix, you have an urgent account problem, click here. The easiest thing to do is just to go to netflix.com yourself, sign in there and see if that message is replicated. Using that second channel of verification, you'll know pretty immediately whether that first email was true or was an attack. And the last component on security is multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor is by far the best form of security commonly available on the web for authentication. We're starting to see multi-factor be required by more and more standards. I know my bank recently required multi-factor. It just came into force. And multi-factor always tie, tries to tie your identity to both something you know and generally something you have. So if you think about the process you use when you use an ATM with a bank, that's multi-factor authentication that people have been doing for years and never realized it. 
because you have to have your bank card to make the ATM do anything. And then you have to know your PIN to be able to access your account. So you had to have something, you had to know something, you multi-factored into your bank account. And what we started doing recently is saying, well, if you have to do that to use an ATM, you ought to have to multi-factor to use online services that do the exact same thing. And so multi-factor is becoming more popular. You'll see it more and more places. The exact mechanisms of how it works vary widely depending on who's implementing it. But overall, multi-factor is kind of our gold standard right now for what we can do in terms of securing an account. And the last piece of this puzzle is the protect it component. And while secure it focused pretty heavily on those technical aspects, protect it focuses more on the human aspects of cybersecurity. So the first part is very simple, is don't trust the internet. It's very easy to, it's very easy to see an email or a news article come across and place 100% of your trust right into that news article. But you can't do that, not on today's internet. Verification is the most important thing for any information you might get from the internet. When I took a cybersecurity class when I started with the county, my instructor loved to hammer to us every day, trust but verify. You can trust that, you get that information, you might trust it, but you've got to verify it before you place your full trust on anything you get from the internet. This is especially true with email. As I mentioned earlier in phishing, emails can be very, very dangerous. They're also very helpful. They are the primary form of communication for almost every business and operation in the United States. But it can be dangerous, especially attachments. Email attachments, again, easy to trust, cause it looks like a person legitimately sent this, but those attachments can have malicious code, malicious payloads, where all it takes is opening one up and their code just ran. So verification is the main protection against that. Verify that the right people are sending you the right documents. Verify that the information you're being presented is what you think it is. The next component is guarding your digital footprint. So it's out there, you've secured it with strong passwords and maybe multi-factor. Now you've got to do some active things to guard it. And the most main points here is you need to take precautions with your important information. Federal government has an information classification system, so obviously stuff classified secret and above is treated a whole lot more carefully than stuff unclassified. On a personal level, it doesn't need to be near that robust, but obviously in your important information, bank accounts, uh, social security numbers, any type of information like that, you need to be careful with and you need to recognize that it is important. And then finally, keep an eye on your devices and your network. So make sure you're staying up to date with software updates. Um, I get a, a feed from a security company that has a list of all the software vulnerabilities discovered this week. And it is amazing how quickly that list moves along. And that is why you get patches on Windows every month and some software faster than that. Those updates are important, and you need to make sure that they're actually getting installed. It's one of the largest ways you'll see devices compromised is purely because they were missing an update. And the last component is to monitor online interaction. This is especially important for two reasons. The primary one is if you're dealing with kids in any sort of form, you need to monitor what they're doing online and who they're interacting with, and second, we have an election coming up, and this was a major focus of the 2016 election. The FBI has been eyeing this intensely over the last few years, and bad actors can and do use social media to exert influence on the general public, on our public opinion. And the Department of Homeland Security pulls this out into a brilliant piece they wrote called The War on Pineapple, which takes the ever-running debate among people whether 
pineapple belongs on the pizza or not. Seemingly trivial, but people tend to have a fairly strong opinion on that. And they go through and show you in ways that if someone's sitting with malicious intent and a little bit of knowledge of social engineering, they can start pushing people's buttons online. And you'll take the seemingly trivial topic of pineapple on pizza and end up with two groups who are ready to go to war with each other over pineapple on pizza. It's an excellent piece and I would recommend looking into it. Speaking of which, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I covered only a handful of these points. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security's website there at the bottom goes into much more depth than I ever could in this meeting. There's a lot of information here and uh, enjoy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Own it, secure it, protect it. Jack will be doing this presentation for uh, some of our internal groups. He also does all of the uh, employee orientations. So he encourages all of our, our new staff to be safe mm -hmm. online. And uh, you have a couple other departments signed up already to, to do this presentation. Uh, additionally, uh, we were able to secure some pamphlets that you have there in front of you, uh, <coughs> chatting about kids being safe online, uh, some basic laptop security bookmark, and another one for adults. Uh, these came from the Federal Trade Commission that um, you also see, you often see that the federal government's creating these publications, and we took advantage of those and getting those free, uh, and we'll be, try we'll be working with uh, Emery and her staff of putting those out in the libraries and other government facilities so um, people can take full advantage of that. I mean, thank you so much for letting us do this presentation tonight. Thank you for offering that. I think that's beneficial for us as well as those folks watching on television at home. Yes, sir. Okay, we move now to discussion items for action. Uh, item 4.1, appointments to boards and committees. And you all have received that list in advance and you also have it before you. Uh, I think each of those comes with recommendations from the various organizations. Is there any discussion that needs to occur about those? Okay, then we will move to item 4.2, a resolution amending the Board of Commissioners 2019 meeting schedule. Um, you see that on page 66, I believe, but that is um, regarding the special work session that we talked about earlier before our regular meeting on October 21st at 4.30. And then also the joint meeting with uh, between the Board of Commissioners and the Board of Education that will be held on Tuesday, October 29th in this room at 6 p.m. And so I think we do need a uh, to suspend the rules uh, to act on approving this resolution tonight. Do I hear a motion to suspend the rules? So moved. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes, and I would now entertain a motion to approve the resolution amending the Board of Commissioners 2019 meeting schedule as I just described. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank you, and we move now to item 4.3, um, purchase of right-of-way for road improvements at West Cabarrus High School and Jonathan Marshall will lead us in that discussion. There are a couple things with this. One, we have been, um, our, real, the, our real estate representatives have been negotiating with property owners on Weddington Road for the required improvements associated with West Cabarrus High School. And we, we've reached agreement with all those property owners on the uh, amount to pay for each of those. There was one major purchase in that, and that is the land that is um, between the high school site and George Lyles Parkway that makes up the majority of this. Um, you are aware that those, the cost of those improvements was much higher than had been budgeted. 
Um, so we have gone back, and if you have questions about that, Brian Cohn, again, can answer those. But um, I've decided that that will be pulled out of the general contractor's um, scope of work, and that will be rebid separately. Um, we feel like, and, you, and you've probably seen some information about this, the bid climate is improving for road projects. There, was a lot, there were a lot of road projects that came on at the same time, particularly from NCDOT. So it was both a lack of bidders and they had a lot of work. Um, so that's being repackaged to bid. Um, they're going to be looking at the time frame, but probably November, December, that time frame to rebid those. And, and I know we've had some questions from some commissioners. Will that still allow time to get the work done? And, and the schools are confident that that will allow time to, to have that work completed. But all that said, that does not change the need for this right of way. So we are moving forward with this recommendation to you to purchase the right of way for this amount. Um, it's a little higher than what was originally budgeted, but Susan Farrington has worked with Kelly Klutz on identifying some money also in the construction accounts for West Cabarrus High School to cover that difference, which is approximately $10,000, $10,000-$15,000 in that range. So the budget amendment is included with this. Jonathan, are these uh, right-of-way purchases reimbursable? I know some of the they are all reimbursable they by are the included state. in what would be reimbursable by the state and actually um, so the work itself it's not just the, the right of way should just be the state although some of this could be um, the result of having to put in curb gutter and sidewalk because some of this is reimbursable from the city of Concord also um, there are two separate statutes as we have found that one that the state is required to reimburse for offsite improvements, but the other that municipalities, should they be requiring improvements, also have to offer some reimbursement. So we've had meetings with um, both NCDOT about the reimbursement process as well as the City of Concord, and then had done the same thing with Hickory Ridge Elementary School, meeting with the state and the town of Harrisburg. Okay. Any questions for Jonathan? Okay. Thank you. And we move now to item 4.4 .4 from Human Resources, Personnel Ordinance Changes, and we're delighted to have Lundy Covington to lead that discussion. Thank you, Commissioners, and I have a, a guest with me as well just to give a brief overview of where we're at with the 24-hour firefighter schedule. So Stephen Langer is going to join us just to share a really quick update. Good evening. So just to kind of give you an update as to, to where we are with the 24-hour schedule. Um, it's taken us a little longer to hire than we, we'd hoped to. We had to run two processes just due to other processes being open at the same time. But we have finally gotten to the point that we have hired the last uh, three individuals for the 24-hour shifts. So they will start their orientation actually next Monday, the 14th. So that's kind of helped uh, lead us to the point to um, – setting a target date for the 24-hour shift uh, and we are looking at October the 24th um, so uh, we worked hard over the last couple months I feel like Lundy has given me a part-time job in HR as <coughs> much as we have met um, but uh, they have been wonderful between HR finance and IT um, they've really helped get us to the point where we need to be uh, to make this transition so that's kind of what has led us uh, here tonight to uh, look at the changes that need to be made to the personnel ordinance is kind of the the last piece to uh, make that transition so I'm going to go through those very briefly and just please um, pause me a little bit if you have questions um, but these changes are in order to make our cruels fair mostly for our firefighters working a 24-hour schedule so again, 1024 is that projected start date. So we're hoping this will be approved and in place in time. Um, in looking at our accruals, what we uh, actually did is we looked at several other city jurisdictions that have firefighters. We looked to Concord, Kannapolis, and also the city of Newton. Um, in addition, we looked at our own history with our 24-hour EMS employees. We had that type of schedule um, several years back. So that was kind of how we, we started the project. Um, we've sat down made recommendations in the meantime we've met with the fire captains and their employees to go over our recommendations we wanted to make sure they felt these were fair adjustments and have received um, support from them as well so in going through the changes the first one has to do with the work week itself and you'll see the highlighted section which is the portion we're proposing to be changed 
Basically, that is just a definition setting out what a 24-hour schedule would look like for firefighters. They would work 24-hour shifts or 212 hours per 28-day cycle. That would equate to 2756 annual hours. This would be following the Fair Labor Standards Act approved cycle for firefighters, which includes a 24-hour day off every third cycle called a Kelly day. So that's the basic work schedule. Any questions on that? If so, I might turn to Steve to... Okay, so with that in place, we then turn to look at our benefit accruals. And I think it's important to remember here that with our firefighters, anytime they take off, they will be taking it in 24-hour increments. Our regular employees would only need eight hours or 12 hours to cover their time away, but for firefighters, it will be a, a block of 24 hours. So we looked at that to make sure we were being fair and consistent. The first area we looked at is our holiday accruals, and you'll see the chart. Within that chart, um, the middle column is actually the hours per pay cycle, and you'll note that the firefighters are 96 or 116, so they will be working a short week and a long week. The mathematical calculation you'll see down there highlighted, um, to get to that, we looked at the schedules. There'll be three shifts working 24 hours, so there's an A, B, C shift. We looked at how that was placed on their calendar and um, considered that each group would be getting five to six holidays per year. So with that, we felt like it's important to err on the high side. So our recommendation there is six holidays times 24 hours will be 144 hours per year. Um, our regular employees are getting 12 holidays. So again, it, it seems proportionally accurate. And you can see on that far right how that equates and looks with our other groups that are on an advanced holiday schedule. So anyone who's in the public safety sector, they can't take holidays off. So what we try to do is give them an equivalent amount of time they can take off at other points throughout the year. So our recommendation there was 144 hours. Um, moving forward to the vacation leave, section four. You'll see two charts with some um, computations. That basically in the first two charts is just some correction to some rounding. Right now we have two decimal places, so we're trying to pull that out to a four decimal place to be a little more accurate on those first two. And then if we can move to the next chart, Lauren. Um, this is actually the new table we would propose for our firefighters. It's a 24-hour schedule, again, based on 96 and 116 hours or an average of 106 for this group. So there the computation we looked at, that 106 hours average, 13 cycles per year, 212 hours per cycle, and the um, computation is 0 .08, 0 .0385, um, per hour at the five-year level, and then it rolls from there. So the calculation is basically the same as our other employee tables. What you'll see that's a little bit different, 106 hours um, for that five-year group, just as an example, whereas for our 80-hour employees, that would be more like an 80-hour amount. So again, Considering they're, they're taking 24 hours off anytime they need to be away, we feel like that computation is, is fair and equitable. Um, the next section down looks at the maximum accrual will allow them to carry. For most of our employees, it's 240 hours if you're a standard employee working 2080. We have a little higher amount for our sheriff's employees. Um, that theirs is 252 hours they're allowed to carry in their vacation bank. For the firefighters, the computation there, we looked at that 212 hours per pay cycle. We added in the 106 average, which brought us to 318. So that's basically allowing them to carry an average of six weeks time off. Again, they'll be taking more time as they need it. What is important about that, um, that's the amount of time they can carry in their bank if they don't use it at the end of the calendar year and it's over that amount, it will roll into sick. So we wouldn't want them to carry that much excess for purposes of payout if they were to leave us. But again, it's trying to give them a proportionally fair number. And the final section is the sick leave accruals. And there the calculation would basically be the same as it is for any employee. 0 0.0462, we just multiply that times either 96 or 116 hours. So again, our recommendation is just to adopt these changes in the personnel ordinance to reflect um, the accruals that would be needed to be fair and consistent for the firefighters. Are there any questions? I know I ran through that pretty quickly, but hopefully that's 
pretty straightforward. Any questions for Lundy? I know I understood every <laughs> every <laughs> detail of it, but we'll move the computations when we put in the ordinance. We just left that in so you could kind of see the math behind it. And again, we did sit down with the firefighters and explain that, and I think they were supportive of the schedules. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. One, one thing uh, when we're talking public safety, the efforts of Lundy and the department is the sheriff and the Jimmy Lentz and, and Bobby Smith and Steve. I think we're probably 90 plus percent full on all three of those um, departments. Excellent. So we're doing very well, uh, much better than we were at this time last year. So now instead of recruitments, uh, we're doing uh, fairs, employment fairs, just to educate those who maybe we might want to catch and be interested in going into those fields in the future instead of actually having vacancies to fill and try to keep filling. So I just thought I'd pass that on. I think it's, a, it's fantastic. And, okay between Lundy and Ashley and then in the, the department heads and departments have done an excellent job. Very good news. Thank you. Okay, we move now to item 4.5 from Infrastructure and Asset Management, bid award for trucks and vans, Michael Miller. Good evening. Uh, a formal bid for six trucks and one van was advertised on August 19th, 2019. Uh, we received one bid for all the vehicles on August 28th, 2019. And it's the recommendation of staff to purchase all seven vehicles from Hilbush Ford for a total cost of $235,578.42. Um, all bids were received and they were within the total amount budgeted um, in the vehicle budget, and they do include tax and tax. So requested action from you guys is for a motion to approve the bid award and authorize the county manager to accept to execute the purchasing agreement between Cabarrus County and Hilbush Ford, subject to revision by the county attorney. Any questions? I guess with vehicles, it's pretty easy to know kind of what what the price should be. I mean, how common is it to only receive one bid? For, um, I'm not sure why we only receive one bid. Uh, uh -huh. We usually do get more than one. We advertise um, through the same avenue this time on the county website. Right. Um, yeah, I was just curious why. It, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I can, just for some context, um, globally, that is a space that a lot of dealerships are getting out of governmental fleet acquisitions. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not quite as profitable as the private sector market. Right. And so more and more you're seeing fewer and fewer vendors that are bidding that work. Yeah. Ford is always very competitive too with their pricing for government right. stuff. Okay. If there are no questions, we'll move to the next item, offer for purchase of surface and ambulances, and Michael will talk about that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we received an offer of $1,000 from a company called JoinETA.com for the purchase of county asset number 8357. Uh, it's a 2014 Chevrolet ambulance. We received a second offer of $1,000 from JoinETA.com for the purchase of county asset number 8358, which is also a 2014 Chevrolet ambulance. Uh, both of these ambulances were replaced with new units in fiscal year 19 and have been taken off the road. Neither ambulance runs reliably at this time. Uh, they both have in excess of 120,000 miles. Um, one ambulance has a, an estimate of $4,000 for repair. The other one has an estimate of five to 7,000 for repair. Um, they'll both start, but they won't go over five miles per hour. Um, so they're pretty much useless. Um, if the purchase goes through, joinETA.com plans to utilize the ambulance bodies only. Uh, they would scrap the actual ambulance chassis and mount those on <coughs> mount our boxes on new chassis. Um, JoinETA.com is a provider of non-emergent medical transportation based in Charlotte. They are a for-profit um, organization. 
if this if this in order to accept this offer we have to go through the upset bid process so if there's any questions I'll try to answer them I had questions Michael but you answered mine earlier so I'm okay you know I mean okay. I would rather it had been a Cabarrus County entity you know putting bid on these but if it's out of the county <coughs> and it follows the normal bid process then no problem sir yeah our, pre our preference is that the fire departments that need them but I think they're all they've not requested any at this time so no sir I think they, they have no need for them. is there a downside of getting rid of an ambulance that won't go greater than five miles no. an hour <laughs> <laughs> if, not in my if opinion there is, I can't <laughs> think of it so you, you don't want us to send that one out to pick you up <laughs> <laughs> okay any other questions or comments from Michael all right thank you thank you okay we move to item 4.8 recycling and waste reduction replacement of roll-off truck we're happy to have Kevin Grant with us good evening the recycling department is requesting approval to purchase a new roll-off truck for our operations um, this would be purchased through a, a state contract um, via Transource Incorporated for $161,000 um this the funding would be obtained through our white white goods funds um and what the white goods funds is that when you go out and purchase an item such as a refrigerator or an appliance you're paying a three dollar disposal tax basically a recycling tax and the state collects that money and redistributes it to the county that we receive on a quarterly basis um and that money is to be used for items such to to facilitate um scrap metal and white good recycling and collection so this truck would be used to haul the white goods and the scrap metal to the scrap metal recycling facility um, it would be used to replace our 2007 model that we have that currently has about 250,000 miles on it um, and then the other thing we would need to do with this is I believe that we have to do a budget amendment to move the white to move the funds from the white goods account down to the recycling account, if I'm not mistaken, Kristen. I don't know if you want to jump up and because she caught this kind of mid-afternoon here on me. It's actually <clears throat> so we've already so the white goods funding is already um, accounted for, so it's fallen into fund balance. So we would appropriate fund balance, and then um, you could purchase the truck from your motor vehicles account. Okay. But the budget amendment does say 180,000 and due to state contract it came in at 161,000 so the budget revision will be updated by the time of your regular board meeting um, I actually sent it while we were in the meeting um, today so it's 161,000 instead of 180 yeah initially when we went out to price these vehicles they were at a 175 to 180 mm -hmm. range so that was that was the reason for that Okay, questions for Kevin. Why do they call it a roll-off truck? Because they actually haul a roll-off container. So they're, they're your open containers that uh, okay, you put gotcha. items in. So it's, it's actually a cab with a chassis is about all it is. And then yeah. you basically hook up the roll-off container. And so you put it onto the back of the right. truck. And it's got a tarp mechanism that goes over it to prevent items from falling off of it. Yeah. So. Hence Very the name good. roll off truck. Great. Learn something every day. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Okay, we move now to item 4.9 from the Sheriff's Office approval of inmate housing contract with Beaufort County. And we're happy to have Chief Bailey with us. Real quick, I guess, but on 4.7, that, that just. Did you get a note to take it off? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. They, I think you guys were talking about 4.7 as well. I, I, <coughs> correct. I didn't mean to shine the light on the fact that I came in late. <laughs> I thought we skipped it and they informed me. No, we're all good. Okay. okay. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. I'm here, here today to get approval for a contract with Beaufort County to house uh, up to 20 of their inmates. Um, they ran a detention center that was in need of repairs and Hurricane Dorian kind of expedited those repairs. So in the, um, in the agreement, we're gonna house 20 of their inmates for $65 a day. That number will fluctuate some. 
Um, unlike um, the SMCP contract that we have with the state where we're housing state inmates, um, they are providing the $65 and also including in that cost will also be any additional medical, in-house medical treatment that we provide for them. So I need a motion to suspend and approve the contract. We do have the uh, capacity to make that, to make that happen. Is in addition to the 65 if it's incurred that, that is correct uh, okay. currently right now with the SMCP contract we get $40 a day from the state but they will not uh, reimburse us the cost for in-house uh, inmate care so if the nurse comes to see them if we provide them any medications that is not reimbursed to us in this contract we're getting $65 a day and Beaufort's going to we're keeping track of every time the inmates see a nurse uh, get an ibuprofen pill uh, and we're sending that invoice to, the, to Beaufort County to cover that cost. And we are blessed right now with plenty of space. I don't want to say that too, too loudly, but, um, but we, we do have the space and the personnel to, to, to facilitate the contract. Okay, any other questions? <coughs> okay, we have a motion and a second to suspend the rules. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes and would now entertain a motion to approve the inmate housing contract with Beaufort County. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes and we move to item 4.10 which is also Chief Bailey. Yes, I think I might need Kristen for this one. Um, just to give you a brief kind of synopsis of, of, of these annex re renovations and repairs. Um, of course, you all know we currently have the annex, which is across the street from where the old sheriff's office used to be. Um, the annex is not operational. It is there, um, but it does require some um, capital improvements to get it back up and running properly uh, to meet code to make sure that all the um, uh, fire suppression systems are working make sure the paintings back up to snuff making sure that the plumbing and everything is done uh, for that um, we kind of have some urgency in getting it done um, we had a jail inspector um, do his annual visit uh, one of the things that he approached us that needed some improvement was our fire plan currently the to house the inmates to get them out of a, of a pod uh, if, the, if there's a fire in the main housing unit, we would currently have to take them to the Sally Port, which is the enclosed but secured area where we bring new, new inmates into the jail. So currently, we don't have the need for the bed space, but we need to get it up and running so that we have a place to take the inmates in case there's a fire in the housing unit. That's number one. Number two is obviously when you look at the Beaufort County situation, we have the raise the age that's coming into effect uh, at the first of the year. Um, I think our number is going to rise um, just from housing, um, just for, for the state's going to, the state's not going to be able to handle the juvenile um, incarcerated inmates that they're going to be getting. Um, so I think there is going to be some potential down the road to utilize that space, maybe generate some revenue uh, down the road. But the primary reason we need this up and running is to have the fire plan uh, meet the state standards. They're also, to get the annex up and running, we, the jail housing unit's now older than 10 years old. So obviously there's painting issues that need to be addressed, um, some general maintenance, and we've been working with Kyle uh, to, to kind of get those things to kind of put in the spotlight and, and get some uh, work done. So um, I think Chris can touch on some of the funding uh, for that to, to kind of do some of these general maintenance issues that we need to take care of. Sure, yeah, so um, the funding is uh, additional revenue received late in the fiscal year, last fiscal year, <coughs> from housing inmates from Union County, similar to the Beaufort County um, setup that uh, you guys just approved. So um, due to the fact that they were received so late in the fiscal year, they, that additional revenue fell to fund balance. So the BA attaches, uh, attached to this agenda item appropriates um, fund balance and then 151,000 for those maintenance projects. One of the things that I think is important is we're generating these funds um, and, and I want to try to keep them in the jail if we can keep them there. 
because again, it's just you know to to have that um, to have that work that needs to be done. It's a good way for us to generate the revenue and housing other people's inmates and no additional personnel. Um, I, I think uh, is really kind of key. And Kristen's been great to to kind of help facilitate this. So these are funds that were generated through that contract with Union County. Okay. Any questions? Okay, very good. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Okay, next up, item 4.11, <clears throat> tax from Tax Administration, Adoption of Schedule of Values, Standards, and Rules. And David Thrift will talk with us about this again. He told us last month he'd be back. Good evening. So, as Chairman Morris mentioned, we've... Uh, We've been working over the past month to go through the process as the statute outlines to adopt and put in place our schedule of values for our revaluation. Um, that process has included last month at your work session um, the presentation of, of the proposed schedule. Uh, we made that available to the public at that time and to the commissioners. Um, that document those two documents actually have been in my office and been available on the website since that, that meeting. Um, September 6th, two days after that meeting, we published a statement in, in the uh, local newspaper establishing that those uh, schedules have been proposed, how to find those schedules, how to access that, and also establishing a public hearing. Um, September 16th, at your regular meeting, we held a um, public hearing on the schedule. And tonight, then, I would be asking you to adopt these two schedules of values, one for the present use value, uh, the other for the market value. Um, the next step beyond that will be to uh, publish four notices consecutively over the next four weeks, uh, notifying the public of the adoption of those schedules, once again referring how the public can access those, uh, where to find them, and also providing detail on <clears throat> um, if anybody takes exception to those schedules, there's a period of time over the next um, month in which that, that can be appealed to the property tax commission. So it's the opportunity for, for any property owner to appeal directly to the state property tax commission. Um, those notifications will happen October 9th, uh, 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th. And then November 8th will be the, the final day in which an appeal can be submitted to the property tax commission. So. At the point of November 8th, if there are no appeals made, those schedule of values will become finalized, um, and we will use that to finalize the revaluation process. Uh, we've certainly been working over the past uh, year and a half on the revaluation, analyzing our neighborhoods, developing this schedule of values. We'll take that time from the, from the 8th, if there's not an appeal, to um, finalize the application of these schedules to make sure we have all the values in the county effective as a January 1st, 2020 valuation date. Um, so I, I would ask then tonight to, uh, for you to suspend the rules and then a motion, two separate motions actually, one to adopt the present use value schedule of values and another to adopt the market value schedule of values. The reason we do those separately is that if there is an appeal of either of those schedules to the state, we can proceed with the other application of, of those. Any questions for David? What have you gotten during this month that this has been available to the public? Have you gotten any <coughs> comments, questions, concerns? So far we've heard no there's been no concerns voiced. Uh, there, there, we have not had anyone come into the office to access the schedule. Um, I've not had any uh, of the public come to discuss that. Uh, certainly, we're, we're open to discuss that you know, from now and, and throughout the process. Um, but it has uh, been available online. And it's been available yeah. online. I, I don't have a tracking as to whether right. and, and how much that's been accessed, but we've, we've had no feedback from the public on, on the current schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, we have reviewed this with our uh, Board of Equalization Review um, and with the aspects of it with certain aspects and, and parts of the community that have helped provide some information uh, but we've had no concerns or, or issues from uh, any right. public feedback at this point. So. Okay, 
Any other questions? Hearing none, I would uh, entertain a motion to suspend the rules. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And at this time, I would entertain a motion to adopt the Cabarrus County 2020 market value schedule standards and rules. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes and would further entertain a motion to adopt the Cabarrus County 2020 present use value schedule standards and rules. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Okay, while you're at the table, write off of 2009 real <coughs> and proper personal property taxes. So switching gears to the collection side, um, the tax collector's office uses all available resources, due diligence, and all remedies uh, that authorize us to collect taxes on both real property and personal property tax bills. Um, however, there's a period of time by a statute that, um, what, what kind of statute 105-378 uh, indicates that we, we could not take any collection remedies after a 10 year period. So after the point when that tax bill has been issued on September 1st, 10 years beyond that, we can't initiate any any further collection remedy so for that reason uh, every 10 years we we come provide um, a list to you with a request to write off the balances that are still outstanding that are that are more than that 10-year period old okay any questions on this it's a pretty substantial list it is a, a significant list. Um, I apologize. I do have a, a total figure um, currently at $342,855.38. Uh, we will update this list if, if anything is paid between now and, and your meeting that potentially could change, um, but it won't, it won't get any larger. It could get smaller. Um, right. There are, uh, you know, we, we take every effort to collect and, and our, our collection staff um, does an excellent job at collection of taxes this year we we hit our uh, over 99 percent mark of, of taxes collected uh, from the prior fiscal year uh, really a great accomplishment but there are situations in which um, tax bills that are uh, put out there are, are uncollected there are uh, bankruptcy protections that are in place there's a number of things that could go on that create a scenario in which we simply have uncollectible taxes Okay, any other questions for Dave? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> okay, we move now to approval of the regular meeting agenda. You all have that um, before you. Uh, does anyone see any uh, changes or corrections to our regular agenda? Yes since we did not discuss that today. Yes. And then I believe he mentioned a public hearing. Did you mention that? When uh, did you mention? I think we did that last In September. Time. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I okay. was just referencing the public hearing Got we had it. at your last meeting. Okay. I missed the September, but I should have remembered that. That's all I see then. And that was the item about the library that you were talking about. F nine. Okay, anything else? Okay, at this time I would entertain a motion to approve the regular meeting agenda as presented with the deletion of item F nine. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. 
That motion passes. And as we mentioned earlier, we do not have need of a closed session uh, tonight. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. We stand adjourned. Thank you.